Are there any issues that we need to discuss before we get started? Um, can I just talk to the state real quick? Sure. All right. Okay. Mr. Neiman wants to recall him because that'd be Thursday after we rest, which is fine. Um, the only other person that would I would have for tomorrow would be uh, Mr. Moberg with the phone downloads. So I'm not sure if you want to move him to Thursday or if you want to break the jury in uh, tomorrow just for him. So you just have one witness lined up for tomorrow? Yeah, because we're going to have to lost all the other witnesses today. Okay. Well, let me ask this question. Sure. As far as, I, I think I'm inclined, if it's only one witness and it's not ex excessively long, to just do all the uh, testimony on Thursday. Is that still um, going to give you enough time to get your witnesses in on Thursday? So, there's, a, there's a few issues. Uh, we okay. talked about me tomorrow bringing in my proper witness, so I could... Yeah, I'd still like to do that tomorrow if we can, because we don't need the jury for that. True, um, but I had some additional arguments before that, which we don't have to do right now, but um, yeah, other than that... It's I mean, what you. I'd like to do, uh, assuming that we have the day clear of witnesses, uh, I'd like to do the proffer witness. I'd like to do our charge conference tomorrow because uh, let's take advantage of uh, having time without ha uh, inconveniencing the jury. And uh, then we bring back the jury on Thursday, knock out uh, the remainder of the testimony, do closings on Monday. That's, uh, I, think that's, I, think, uh, I think that's a plan. We should make sure, though, that I know Ms. Tagliarini is this afternoon. We well, that, I'm not going to tell the jury that until we know for sure we can get through right, all right, our right, testimony right. today. Yeah. If we do get through our, all our testimony today, then I will. Right. Then I'll tell them because you never know how things go. Right. Okay, uh, we are we now ready to uh, bring in the jury? You're still marking the exhibits there, Ms. I'm ready to go, Judge. Okay. Yes. All right, fair, fair enough. All right, let's bring in the jury.
nobody put the notebooks out, huh? <laughs> it shows right over here. Show, my, my bailiff will be happy to hear how indispensable he is. So. <laughs> Fortunately, he is out today. Why don't you lay them out on a uh, on a bar and, and let them find their notebook? your book there. All right, everyone, please be seated. Let me just give my clerk a moment. Get that here in a minute or two. All right, the state may call its next witness. So you will call Dr. Stephen Robinson. Yeah. You can uh, bring in Dr. Robinson, please. Mm -hmm. Approach the witness stand, and when you get there, please remain standing to be sworn in. And if our bailiff can get the uh, blank um, notebook for our juror, please raise your right hand to be sworn in. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give should be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. You may be seated. Yes, Stephen, middle initial L, last name Robinson. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, may you proceed. Thank you, Judge. Good morning, Dr. Robinson. Good morning. Sir, where do you work? Uh, Broward County Medical Examiner's Office and Trauma Services. Okay, and how long have you worked there? Seven years, ten months. And what's your position there? Deputy Chief Medical Examiner. And can you um, tell us a little bit about your background, training, and the education you received uh, to become a, the, the Deputy Chief Medical Examiner? Uh, yes, um, I guess we can start with a bachelor degree, uh, undergraduate degree from Syracuse University, from there Howard University Medical School, MD degree, uh, from there residency training in anatomic and clinical pathology, ending in board certification in both. From there, a one-year fellowship in forensic pathology, uh, ending in uh, board certification in forensic pathology. Wow. Can you move, just move a little bit closer to closer. the microphone? I'm sorry, the court reporter is having some Okay. <laughs> Good doctor, if you can just raise the volume a tiny bit and, and the speed a little slower. Okay. I think okay. it'll, it'll be easier for everyone. Not okay, speed. slower and louder. Yes, Got there it. you go. Okay. Repeat? Should I repeat or are we good? No, I think we, we got it. Uh, okay. Go for it. Thank you. Um, Dr. Robinson, can you tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what an autopsy is? An autopsy, an autopsy is a um, post-mortem uh, examination um, in the, with the, the uh, goal is to uh, determine cause of death uh, collect evidentiary material if applicable, and uh, in some cases to help determine the manner of death, and also identification in some cases. 
And during the course of your entire history doing this type of work, approximately how many autopsies have you performed? Um, somewhere around 2,000 north or south. Now, in addition to working at the Broward County Medical Examiner's Office, did you have any other um, experience in forensic pathology? I did. And what was that? Um, prior to Broward County, I was the uh, Deputy Armed Forces Medical Examiner. Okay. And what did you do in that role? I was, uh, at that time, I was active duty Navy, and we performed uh, post-mortem examinations or medical legal examinations in, uh, at the birth. Um, had a federal interest. Okay. And I want to zoom in now to this case for the reason that we're here today. Mm -hmm. um, on October 6th of 2017, did you perform an autopsy on someone identified as Nicholas Wilcox? I did. Okay. And approximately what time did you conduct that autopsy? 10, 10 a.m. Okay. And <clears throat> can you describe the condition uh, of Mr. Wilcox's body when it was received at the medical examiner's office? Uh, when we received the decedent, he was actually wrapped uh, in two tarps and uh, some assorted blankets. The uh, Both tarps uh, were uh, s sealed with uh, black adhesive tape, and I believe one belt was also present. And Your Honor, permission to approach? You may approach. Okay, Dr. Robinson, I'm going to show you. Four photographs of the Freemark states KK, LL, MM, and NN. If you can take a look at these, let me know if you recognize them. depicts what you just described to us when you received Mr. Wilcox's body? They do. Judge, at this time, state we seek to admit with three three marks KK, LL, MM, and NN, 37 through 40. All right, that'll be admitted as uh, st state exhibits 37 through 40. May publish. Dr. Robinson, starting with States 37. <clears throat> Can you tell us what we're looking at in this photograph. Um, basically, this is uh, uh, photos, photographs taken during our sessioning process. Uh, you, uh, this case was sealed. Uh, with identification tags, and basically this is an intake photo to show um, that the seal was received unbroken. Okay, and Dr. Robinson, in the top right corner, <clears throat> excuse me, we see a placard uh, with the number 173256. Can you tell us what that number is and why you use it? Okay, basically the, the number 17-3256 is our, our medical examiner number. Every case that comes to our office is assigned a number uh, for tracking purposes. Okay, so any photograph or any documentation or any samples or anything that, like that pertaining to this case will be assigned that same number? That is correct, yes. And then just kind of moving uh, counterclockwise a little bit, the, there's a tag on there that starts with removal transportation services. Can you tell us what we're looking at there and what the purpose of that is? That is a tag uh, basically applied to by our removal services that, that has the identification information uh, for the decedent. Okay, and then um, kind of around 6 o'clock we see a red tag there, can you tell us what that is? The red tag, that's the actual seal with the uh, number 067682, that's applied at the scene, um, and this um, uh, shows that the uh, evidence and the, content, the um, contents of the bag were not uh, open prior to our arrival. Okay, and then lastly, that small um, brownish-orange uh, envelope. 
I believe that's all. That's a that's applied by our text when it's received by our office. Uh, as our additional number or ME number, uh, we put the weight. The height is not known at the time because we haven't opened the bag. And then the BTB means uh, believed to be. Uh, formal identification has yet had not yet been made at this time. Showing you states thirty eight. <clears throat> what is this photograph showing us? This is a photograph of the decedent as received in our office after we uh, removed the white bag with the seal. Uh, this was the contents. This is one of two tarps that the decedent was wrapped in and with numerous uh, black adhesive uh, portions of tape and a belt. States 39. Uh, this is uh, after the outer tarp is removed, and the, I believe this also the inner tarp has been opened, and this is the decedent believed wrapped in some sheets and blankets. <clears throat> and stays 40. Again, another view it looks like it might be just a view of the uh, inner tarp with the outer tarp removed. Did you yourself remove that tarp from Mr. Wilcox's body? I assisted, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, um, after the body was removed from that tarp, what is the next step in the process that you do? The next step in that process is we do a complete external examination with photo documentation. Um, and we also, in this particular case, we're keeping an um, eye out um, to obtain any potential of, uh, material of evidentiary value. And Dr. Robinson, these photographs, do you take photographs in every single autopsy you perform? We do. Okay, and what's the purpose of the photographs? Our documentation of what we do to, uh, as, in support of our written report. Okay, and when the photographs are taken, are they taken um, sort of in order from start to finish during the course of the autopsy? We have an order, yes. Okay. Judge, permission to approach? approach. Dr. Robinson, showing you what's been pre marked states OO. PP and QQ. We'll look at these three photographs. And Dr. Robinson, <clears throat> do you take photographs of different portions in, of the body and the body in its entirety before it's cleaned off? Yes, we do. Okay. Showing you states 44. Can you tell us what we're looking at in this photograph? This is a photograph of the, uh, basically an uncleaned photograph, or what we say is as is uh, photograph pre-washed of the uh, left hand of uh, our case 173256, bearing a metallic ring on the fourth finger. And these marks that we see, what, what are those marks? That's, that's blood that hasn't been washed away yet. Okay. 
42. And this is a uh, RK 173256, a photograph of the right hand. And for modesty's sake, I'm going to cover up the bottom part of this photograph, but um, can you tell us, Dr. Robinson, what we're looking at in this photograph? Uh, again, this is a uh, as-is or pre-cleaned um, photograph taken after the actually all tarps and blankets had rem been removed from the decedent, uh, our case 17-3256. Ultimately, was the body washed off and cleaned? Yes. Any other alterations made to the body? Um, head shaved or anything like that? Yes. Uh, 44, Dr. Robinson showing you states 44. Can you tell us what we're looking at in this photograph? <clears throat> we're looking at a, for one of our facial identification type photograph after the decedent had been cleaned up, uh, our number 173256. Okay, and what's the purpose of this photograph? Uh, we Basically, it's an identification photograph that we keep in our files. Basically, this is again uh, our K seventeen thirty two fifty six. This is a photo showing the uh, injuries to the chin and lower lip. Forty six. This is a profile shot seventeen thirty two fifty six from the left side, showing the injuries from uh, on that side of the face and head. States forty seven. Again, 1732.56, this is a right side, showing injuries to the right side of the uh, head and face. Thank you. 
approach. Okay. Dr. Robinson showing you this in three marks states VZWWXXYY. Take a look at those four okay. photographs. <clears throat> They do. This time statement seek to invent this one, three mark W, I'm sorry, V, V, W, W, X, X, and Y, it states 48, 51. All right, that'll be uh, admitted uh, into evidence uh, 48 through 51 uh, uh, states exhibits. see depicted in this photograph? Uh, this is a, a frontal facial shot, 173256. Basically what we're showing is the injury to the lower lip and the gum and teeth uh, behind that lower lip. Okay, and Dr. Robinson, sort of in the dead center of the photograph, there's a black void there in between the two teeth. Is that the way Mr. Wilcox's mouth was naturally, or is that due to an injury? That's injury. That's what we're looking at there is actually a fracture of the mandible or jawbone. This is, I don't see our number. Is our number in there? Sorry. Ah, there we go. Our number is 1732.56. This is a cleaned up uh, a photograph of the left hand minus the uh, metal ring. Okay. See, it's 50. Again, this is uh, RK 1732.56, a cleaned up view of the right hand. Okay, this is uh, the right side, right face and head of RK-1730-256, showing the injuries to the scalp. Uh, what we've done in this photograph is shaved the hair so we can uh, clearly see the injuries that are on the scalp. photographs of the injuries, do you also document each injury with a specific letter? I do. Okay, can you tell us a little bit about that process and how you go about doing that? On uh, this particular case, is the, the letters we resolve to the uh, injuries to the neck, and basically it's a random process. We start with A, every doc has a uh, system of doing it. I basically go top to bottom, right to left. to the photographs and the markings of the injuries, you also author a report for each autopsy you perform, correct? I do. And in your report, do you go through and describe each injury that you've labeled? I do. <clears throat> Now, uh, before we look at any more pictures, um, in this autopsy of Mr. Wilcox, can you tell us just overall, in general, the injuries that he had? Uh, overall, uh, inj injuries uh, to the uh, 
head and neck. Uh, he had basically essentially two groups of injuries. He had blunt force injuries. Uh, those are injuries caused by an object uh, that's rounded or otherwise does not have a cutting edge to it. Uh, those were predominantly of the head. Um, uh, the lower part of his face and his neck, he had what we call sharp force injuries or incised injuries. And those are injuries caused by an object that has either a cutting edge or some sort of sharp edge to it. And how many blunt force injuries did he have? Uh, he had at least six. And how many sharp force? Um, six stabs, seven cutting, 13 total. Showing you four photographs. Pre marked is the ZZ3A, 3B, and 3C. You need to take a look at these four and let me know if you recognize them. They do. All right, that'll be uh, admitted into evidence as states exhibits 52 through 55. Starting in states 53, what are we looking at in this photograph? Uh, we're looking at a facial view of RK173256. Uh, basically, we have our ruler with our number on it, and it's being t uh, this photo was taken to show the injuries of the uh, central face and forehead. side view, uh, right face and head of RK173256. Uh, this photograph was taken to show the injury to the right ear. And Dr. Robinson, we discussed those markers um, and we'll start with A, states 52. Okay. Can you just tell us what we're looking at in this photograph and, and what the little marker is? Sure. We're looking at, uh, again, this is a, a frontal view of the front of the neck. Uh, there is an injury that the marker A, the tip is pointing to. Uh, this was a penetrating stab wound. Okay, and this particular wound, do you know how deep this wound was? One and a half inches. Seventeen thirty-two fifty-six. This is a closer view, uh, a frontal view of the uh, anterior frontal surface of the neck, wound to A. Dr. Robinson, 
Dr. Robinson, are you able to tell us what caused those wounds or any of the wounds on Mr. Wilcox's body? Again, um, the, we've separated into two cat broad categories, uh, as we talked about before, blunt. The, the head injuries and the scalp injuries were uh, blunt injuries, again, by a, a blunt object uh, without an edge or, or cutting surfaces, could be any rounded surfaces. Um, then the neck wounds were, were incised, uh, meaning they were caused by something sharp, something with a cutting edge or a sharp edge to it. Yes. Photographs taken from Mr. Wilcox's autopsy. I'm oh, sorry. Photographs taken from Mr. Wilcox's autopsy. Yes. Okay. But at this time, state seeks to admit within three marks: three D, three E, three F, three G, and three H as fifty-six. All right. That'll be admitted into evidence as state's exhibits fifty-six. And Dr. Robinson showing you states 56. Okay. Again, what we're looking at is the uh, front left side of the neck, 173256. Uh, this is designated by the uh, indicator as wound B. And again, uh, is that a sharp force injury? It is. Okay, and approximately how deep is that injury? Uh, this one also was uh, approximately a hundred, a one and a half inches in depth. Okay, it's 57. Okay, the K1732-56. This is it's kind of close, but I believe we're the, we're the right side of the neck, just under the chin. Uh, that is our wound C, as indicated by the orange pointer. Okay, and again, sharp force injury. Uh, yes, this is also sharp force injury. Okay. And the depth of that. This one was termed a cutting wound or incised wound, and this one had a depth of approximately one quarter inch. <clears throat> side of the neck, uh, lower portion, 173256, and this is our wound designated as D, uh, as shown by the orange pointer. Okay, and um, what type of wound is D? D, it was a, uh, it's a stab wound which, uh, with a depth, maximum depth of approximately one and one quarter inches. This is 
are K1732, 56, a little blurry, ah, better. Um, this is, uh, we're looking at um, the lower right side of the neck, almost getting to the chest, and this is designated as wound E, uh, as shown by the orange marker. Okay, and what type of wound? E is also a penetrating stab wound, and that had a maximum depth of approximately two inches. And state 60. Okay, actually this is showing uh, what we call a group of two wounds, um, 173256. This is the middle part, lower neck, almost upper chest. Um, and what we're showing is the two wounds on either side of the pointer, the orange pointer designated F. Okay. And a stab wound? By a group of two penetrating stab wounds, yes. Show you states 44 once again. Um, the injuries that we see here um, in this area of Mr. Wilcox's face are those stab wounds? Those are not. That is blunt force injury. And how are you able to tell that? Uh, basically, we see um, the abrasion pattern around the actual wounds. These are lacerations, which are actually tears in the skin caused by something that impacts the skin, doesn't cut it, but tears it. And when you have that tearing, it causes marks on the skin that you don't see in sharp force injuries like we saw on the neck. Uh, plus the uh, level of skull injury associated with this is, is consistent with a blunt force and not a stabbing. Okay. And though we didn't see a photograph of it, um, in addition to the pictures we did see, did you were you able to look... For, I mean, for lack of a better phrase, were you able to look underneath Mr. Wilcox's skin? I was. Okay. And can you just describe what that looks like and what that process is? Uh, basically, and you can probably get a sense that uh, from looking at that the face is, has a dent in it. Uh, basically, all most of the bones of the face were crushed. The skull was multiply fractured. The brain was injured. Again, showing you states 48. Uh, this injury that we discussed earlier, is that a blunt force injury? Yes, this is also a blunt force injury. And in states 54, these injuries we see here to the side of Mr. Wilcox's head. Stab wounds or blunt force injuries? The scalp injuries and those are the areas where we shave the, the hair. That's all consistent with blunt force injury because you can see the abrasion surrounding the break in the skin that we talked about. Uh, the ear, like most likely a blunt force injury just because of the tearing pattern and not a clean incised injury. <clears throat> autopsy of Mr. Wilcox, were you able to ascertain his height and weight? Oh, we did. He was 189 pounds, and he was a length of 69 inches. And Dr. Robinson, um, as part of your duties, um, do you opine cause and manner of death? I do. Okay, and when I say the phrase cause of death, what does that mean? Cause of death is the actual mechanism or biologic malfunction that caused the person to die. And in Mr. Wilcox's case, what was his cause of death? Um, basically multiple blunt and sharp force injuries. Okay. And when I say manner of death, what does that phrase mean? Manner of death is an opinion uh, based on the autopsy findings and circumstances surrounding how the injuries occurred um, determines them, uh, how we decide manner. Okay. And um, what are the various manners of death? Uh, currently, we're using five. It's undetermined, natural, suicide, accident, homicide. And 
in Mr. Wilcox's case, what was his manner of death? We did, we did uh, decide, determined his uh, manner of death to be homicide. Okay. And when you say homicide, it's not necessarily a legal definition. It has a, a medical sort of definition. And what is that definition? Correct. And, and it's in the medical, it's a medical opinion, uh, basically meaning the death occurred at the hands or the actions of another. Okay. As opposed to something like suicide where it's the hands of oneself. Correct. Nothing further. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. Thank you. Any uh, cross-examination? Yes, thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, Dr. Robinson. Good morning. So, let me start off with, you are obviously very well credentialed, but you are not an expert in physics, correct? That is true. So in order to determine, um, or would you be able to determine the weight, strength, height of the person who killed Mr. Wilcox? No, I could not. And it appears to you, because you don't have the weapons, it appears to you that two different objects may have been used, right? Either that or two different edges or sides of the same weapon. Okay, so it could have been a, a long object that can be used for the blunt injuries, but it also could have a sharp edge on the other end, I guess is that possible. Is, that's a possibility, yes. Now, the stab wounds that we see, right, I, I think you called them sharp injuries? Sharp or force, incise, yes. mm -hmm. um, They don't look, correct me if I'm wrong, they don't look like a typical, if someone were using a sharp object like a knife, they don't look like a typical um, stab wounds, they look kind of stretched out, am I correct in that? Well, um, they do look like typical stab wounds because uh, the skin has lines of turgor, so when you cut the skin, depending on what, with the grain or without, against the grain, if you will, the, the, the wounds will stretch out. Okay, so they, they look to you, although to people who are not in this field, they look wider than I think we would think a stab wound would be, but to you they're consistent with a sharp object like a knife. They are, correct. Okay. Now, let's go back to how you first received the body. You said there were uh, two tarps and also a blanket, correct? Correct, yes. And they were wrapped, uh, or Mr. Wilcox was wrapped tightly in those with lots of duct tape around it. Uh, correct, black adhesive tape, yes. And also the belts. I don't remember if we could see the belts in the pictures. Do you was, remember? There was one belt that was difficult to see. Okay. Pretty clear <coughs> that somebody inside something like that would not be able to survive if they even had been put in alive, meaning they would not be able to breathe. I'm not sure. I don't know if it was airtight or not. I couldn't say. Um, now, after he is unwrapped mm -hmm. from all of the uh, tarps and whatnot, you showed pictures, or Ms. McGuire showed you pictures of Mr. Wilcox's hands, right? Yes. After unwrapping him, crime scene was there as well. I, I think it was crime scene tech Hanlon. They were. Crime scene was there, yes. Crime scene was there from Plantation Police Department. Yes. And they collected um, fingernail clippings from Mr. Wilcox? I think we did. You, okay, but you know that fingernail clippings were collected. Correct, correct. Yes. And those items are given to, uh, to the crime scene unit for processing? Correct. Right, correct. you guys don't keep those. No, 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 it's, it's turned over. Okay. And other uh, uh, samples? of blood, tissue, what have you, are also retained? Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. I have nothing further. Thank mm -hmm. you, sir. Thank you. Any uh, regret? Yes, sir. Dr. Robinson, showing you states 49. Again, a photograph of Mr. Wilcox's hand. Any defensive wounds on these on this hand? Uh, could you raise the number up? Funny that way. Uh, no, we didn't. We after um, 
cleaned up an inspection, we didn't find any evidence of defensive injuries or okay. injuries on his hands. Stage 42. Again, this will be his right hand. And no, we did not, uh, even after cleaning, we didn't find any evidence of injuries on his hands. Okay. No defensive wounds? Correct. No defensive wounds on his forearms? No. Okay. And Dr. Robinson, when I say that phrase, defensive wounds, what does that mean? In, in the literature, defensive wounds are typically, uh, well, wounds that are, are uh, have been uh, associated with defensive posture. Wounds usually, uh, but typically the hands and arms, and because these are the type, these are the instruments that we would use if we're someone is attacking us and we're defending ourselves. In some cases, depending on circumstances, the scene is on or on the ground. Let's say you can actually even see injuries can uh, that can be associated with defense in, on the legs, the legs and thighs also. So defensive wounds quite literally means you're trying to protect your center mass, your face, your head, your, your center body. Correct, correct. It's our natural instinct when someone is coming, you just throw up for protection. Yes, correct. Okay, and you indicated a natural instinct, but when you see someone coming. Correct. Okay. So if perhaps Mr. Wilcox had been asleep, would that explain? Objection. Speculation. Well, if he can answer it. Uh, within his expertise as an M, uh, ME, I'll allow him to attempt to answer it. You can ask the question. So, Dr. Robinson, in your opinion, does lack of defensive wounds indicate that Mr. Wilcox did not see this attack coming? Objection to uh, lack of personal knowledge. As to that specific question, I'm going to uh, sustain the objection. Thank you. I have nothing further, Dr. Robinson. All right, uh, you may step down. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. All right, let's uh, take about a five-minute break. Uh, please leave your notebooks at or by your chairs. The deputy will take you back to the jury room.
Jacobson along with his counsel and counsel for the state. Are we ready to proceed? Yes, yes. All right, let's bring in the jury. One, please be seated. All right, we are ready to continue. The state may call its next witness. The state will call Marjorie Hamlin. Not where I need him to be. Thank you, Deputy. All right, if you can please approach the witness stand, take your time, and when you get there, uh, remain standing and please raise your right hand to be sworn in. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give should be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. You may be seated. And then may we approach the witness stand? Uh, yes.
And I think we're all on the same page now. All right, you may uh, inquire the witness. Oh, wait, did we swear in? No. Um, Let's swear in. Can I get your name, please? Marjorie, M-A-R-J-O-R-I-E, Hanlon, H-A-N-L-O-N. Thank you. Okay, so we did swear in and we just didn't get the name on the record. Okay, gotcha. Go ahead. Good morning, Ms. Hanlon. Good morning. Ms. Hanlon, where do you currently work? I'm retired. And where did you retire from? I retired after 30 years with the Plantation Police Department. Okay, and at your time uh, with Plantation, what did you do for the police department? Um, I initially started the crime scene unit, and I was the latent print examiner. Okay, and when you say latent print examiner, what, what is that? That would be taking a standard set of fingerprints taken from a person and comparing those to prints from a crime scene. Okay, was that your primary role for a while? At the end, yes. And in addition to that, did you also respond to various crime scenes, collect various items of evidence, things like that? Yes, as the coordinator, technical coordinator for the unit, I was the um, coordinator for major crime scenes. Okay. And um, were you involved in this case that we're here for today, back in October of 2017? I was. Specifically October 5th, 6th, and so on? Correct. Okay. Yes, I was. And on the night of October 5th of 2017, did you initially respond to a residence in Plantation? I did. Okay. And also, uh, in addition to that, did you respond anywhere else that night? I responded to the crime scene, um, which is in a shopping center, a strip, strip shopping center. It's got a Publix in it. It's got, I don't know what's in there now, because it's been a few years. But the, at the time, there was a veterinarian, there was a dental office, there was... Um, a business office, I believe a real estate office. There were a couple businesses. And it was in a U shape, and it was in the left side of the U, the, the north side of the U. And the south and the east side of the U was uh, Publix, and then on the north side were several restaurants. Okay. And uh, specifically, you responded to the Publix? No, it was on the north side of the shopping center behind the veterinarian's office, behind the dental office. Okay. What, specifically a dumpster? Yes, it was. And as part of your duties and responsibilities with crime scene, did you photograph that scene? I did. Were you the only crime scene tech out there, or were there others with you? There were others with me. Um, we work in a team fashion. There's usually two others with me being the supervisor of this scene. Okay. <clears throat> your Honor, permission to approach? You may approach. Ms. Okay, Hanlon, showing you with some pre marked States 3I, 3J, 3K, 3L. You take a look at those four photographs. Let me know if you recognize them. I do. Accurately depict the dumpster behind the Publix on that night? They do. Judge at this time, state would seek to admit with three marks 3L, um, 3K, 3J, and 3I, and 61 through 64. 61 through. 64. All right, uh, that'll be admitted as States Exhibit 61 through 64. May publish. Ms. Hanlon showing you state 61. Okay, what, what are we looking at in this photograph? This is uh, the dumpster enclosure with the dumpster in it. Um, and inside the by, this is in the back of the alley facing east to the east. Maybe that makes it worse. Okay, and uh, Ms. Hanlon, when you're going to this specific crime scene or any crime scene, um, are you taking photographs during the whole time you're there? The majority of time, yes. We take a distant photograph, we go closer in and do a medium range photograph, and then we try to close in and make uh, some close-up photographs at the time. Okay. 
Do you take photographs before you do any evidence collection or manipulate any possible evidence? Yes, we try to take all of our photographs before the medical examiner gets there um, and starts moving the body around so that we can uh, make sure it's all been documented prior to his arrival. Okay. And in this particular case, um, were you notified that there was a body in relation to this dumpster? I was. Um, the commanding officer on scene was Sergeant Ryan at the time, and she advised me that there had been somebody that had already gotten into the dumpster to make sure that there was a body inside there, inside the package. Showing you states 62. Okay. And what is this photograph showing us? Okay, this is once the medical examiner had arrived. Um, we used the, one of the ladders from our crime scene vans and allowed the medical examiner to get up in there and using a board, they lifted the body out and put it on the top of a tarp. The yellow tarp belonged to the police department. Okay. And um, it, it looks as though there's something white sort of parallel to the, to the tarp. What, what is that? Right. It's on a, uh, the body's placed on a tray, and on top of the tray is a white sheet. States 63. Okay. And in this photograph? Um, this is the actual body ro rolled up together in a tarp and then sealed inside that tarp. Okay. Now, at the time this photograph was taken, had this tarp been opened? It had not. And um, when, at what point was the tarp eventually opened? Um, I requested that the medical examiner not open it on scene for fear of losing any physical evidence we might find. So we waited and it was transported. The white sheet was closed over top of it and it was transported on that tray to the medical examiner's office and it was not opened until we got to the autopsy the next day. And were you present at the autopsy? I was. And still looking at date 63, um, and sort of you know, from, from where I'm looking at, it's the right-hand side, but um, there's an item right here at the bottom. What is that item? Right, I believe that's the belt securing the tarp to the body. State 64. Sorry, focus. Okay. And what are we looking at in this photograph? This would be the belt. Okay, and this photo was taken at the um, medical examiner's office? Correct. Okay. Do you have permission to approach? You may approach. I'm showing you what's been pre marked as states 3M. This is Mary. Can you take a look at this item? Let me know if you recognize that. What it is? Yes, I do. Okay. It appear to be tampered with in any way? No, it does not. Okay. And at this time, state will seek to admit the proof of mark the states 3M. Now it will be admitted as state 65. Mm -hmm. Um, this is, uh, I believe this is another belt that was found in the dumpster. I don't believe that's the one taken from the medical examiner's office. Okay. But again, collected in preserves as evidence? Yes. regards to any of the items found in the dumpster, um, were swabs collected from any, from the, any of the belts specifically? Yes, the belts were both swabbed. Um, there was a, two belts involved in this, one on the body and one on just laying loose inside the dumpster. Both belts were swabbed. Permission to approach? Ms. 
gentleman showing you with the pre marked estates three Enzas and Nancy. Look at that. Yes. Do you recognize the package? I do. Does it appear to be tampered with or altered in any way? It does not. And judge at this time, state would seek to admit with the pre marked estates three A. All right, that'll be admitted uh, as states 66. And Ms. Henlon, what is inside this package right here? The, these are swabs that were taken from, um, from the, let me read it first. Um, swabs that were taken from the inside of the belt, I believe. Yes, swabs of the belt from the dumpster. So not the one that's on the body, but under the body. Okay. And we heard a little bit um, from other crime scene techs that have come in, but tell us what a swabbing is and why it was done of this particular item. Okay, because we have a body laying on top of a belt, we look, go through the garbage and may see if there's anything there that could possibly pertain to the scene itself. In the event that it does, in a dumpster, we collect that. So we don't know if that's involved at the time or not involved. Um, so we go through, and to take a swab, we try, uh, we take two sterile swabs and put distilled water on them and then take the swabs, uh, swabbings of the inside of the belt to get the DNA from the stomach or any sweat that might be on there. And then they're secured in a way, uh, cardboard box and then placed in a plastic bag to air dry. I mean, I'm sorry, paper bag to air dry. Okay. Now, in addition to the dumpster behind Publix, did you also participate in processing of a Ford F-150 pickup truck? I did. I do. Do those photographs accurately depict the F-150 we just discussed? Yes, they do. Your Honor, at this time, state would seek to admit between three marks, three O, three P, three Q. That would bring us up to 69. All right, that'll be uh, state's exhibits uh, 67, 68, and 69 in evidence. Um, where was it processed? The vehicle um, was in the back of our police compound in a secured compound, and then it was we had put uh, evidence tape around it so nobody would go and touch it. Okay. And was um, the vehicle photographed? It was inside now. Showing you state 67. Okay, what is in this photograph? This is the vehicle backed into the parking space. As it was towed in, a tow truck would put it in a space for us. And as you can see, it's not really in a space. It's kind of catty-cornered to the space. But it, that, it, that's where it had been undisturbed all night. Okay. Cool. State 69. And those, uh, that's the contents of the flatbed. Okay, and the contents that we see here, this is uh, undisturbed in any way. This is the way that the car came in. Correct. Okay. And what do we see in this? We've got a, a shovel and a piece of copper piping.
approach. Ms. Hill, in showing you a series of photographs that have been pre marked, three R, three S. 3T, 3U, and 3V. Take a look at those. Let me know if you recognize them. Yes. Accurately represent the F-150 on the date you processed it? Yes, they do. to evidence and what, what the, all right that'll be states exhibits 70 through 74 Ms. Hanlon showing you state 70. That is the interior center console of the front seat of the car, of the F-150. 71. That's what the top of it closed down, but it's from the passenger side looking towards the driver's side. And again, this is the way the truck came in, nothing had been touched, processed, or disturbed yet. Correct. Okay. 72. That's one of the receipts that we located inside the vehicle from Big Lots. Sorry, this thing is, it works very hard to, okay. Can you tell us what the date uh, and time is of the receipt? October 5th, 2017 at 9, 10 a.m. Okay, and are you able to tell us here what the various items were that were purchased? Yes. Um, You've kind of moved it up a little bit. Starting at the top, uh, there's a bottle of peroxide, a roller cover, paintbrush for varnish, duct tape, roller frame, a uh, util util utility knife, a folding utility knife, a paint tray that's green, spray bottle, Mr. Clean two-pack reusable, I don't know whether that was a spray pack or what it was, um, and the amount was Twenty-five eighty-six. Okay. And how did that person purchase this pay? They paid for it with cash. State seventy-three. This is at the Broward County dump. Um, when you go in, they give you a receipt as, as you pay. They give you a receipt, and this is the receipt for that. Okay. And, um, the time and date of this? October 5th, 2017 at 1025 a.m. State 74. As it states, this is a map of the dump area. Um, when you pay your, your fee to dump in the uh, landfill, they give you a map. They tell you to go there and then you're to stay there until somebody tells you what area to dump your stuff in. Okay. Now, in addition to um, photographs of these items, did you collect the items themselves? Yes, we did. And they were processed for fingerprints. <clears throat> Your 
permission to approach? You approach. Ms. Hanlon showing you what's been pre-marked states 3W. Take a look at this package. Let me know if you recognize it. I do. Okay, it appeared to be altered or tampered with in any way? It does not. All right, that'll be admitted as state 75. And Ms. Hanlon, what is inside of this bag? This bag has the, um, from the center console, the big lots receipt. I think this is just the big lots receipt. I don't think the other paper is there. Okay. Your Honor, permission to approach? You may approach. Uh, showing you Ms. Hanlon what's been pre marked at seats 3X. Yes, this has got the Home Depot receipt um, that was collected from the vehicle also. Uh, appear to be altered or tampered with in any way? No. All right, that'll be admitted as states 76. Yes, I do. Okay, appear to be altered or tampered with in any way? No. Okay. Mm. These are the front passenger floorboard Home Depot receipts. Judge, at this time, state would seek to admit what's been pre marked in seats 3Y. All right, that'll be admitted as states exhibit 77. I do. Okay, appear to be tampered with or altered in any way? No. Okay. This is from the driver's side visor, and it's the waste management receipt dated October 5th. Thank you. Your Honor, at this time, state would seek to admit what's been pre-marked as states 3Z. That'll be admitted as states exhibit 78. Were swabs collected from a pair of shoes, the interior of a pair of shoes belonging to the defendant, Mr. Robinson? Yes, they were. <clears throat> You're under permission to approach? You may. Ms. Hanlon, showing you what's been pre marked as states 3A, or 4A, excuse me. Just let me know if you recognize that package. I do. Okay, does it appear to be altered or tampered with in any way? No, that does not. Judge, at this time, state would seek to admit what's been pre-marked as states 4A as 79. All right, that'll be admitted as states exhibit 79. And Ms. Hanlon, can you tell us, please, what the contents of this package Yes, they're the swabs from the inside suspect's right shoe, swabs from the inside suspect's left shoe, swabs 
from, I don't know what that swab is. The suspect's right shoe exterior. The swabs from the suspect's shoe left exterior. And permission to approach us? No. Now, Ms. Hanlon, uh, moving away from the shoe for a moment, um, were other swabs collected, some from the medical examiner's office, uh, another what we call a buckle swab or a standard swab collected in this case? Yes, they were. Okay, and were those also packaged by you? Yes, they were. Okay, showing you has been pre-marked as states 4B. Look at that and let me know if you recognize it. I do. Okay, and with the exception of the cut at the top, it appears to be tampered with or altered in any way? No, there's same one, same okay. as I submitted them. Okay. Your Honor, at this time, state would seek to admit what's been pre-marked as states 4B. All right, that'll be admitted as states exhibit 80. First one is a swab of the interior steering wheel from the F-150. The second one is the swabs for elimination purposes. We had one of our employees accidentally touch the exterior of the driver's door and we wanted to make sure we could eliminate his DNA from the scene. So those are the buckle swabs she's referring to. Okay, and let me interrupt for one second. What, what's a buckle swab or a standard swab? The inside swab? of your cheek. So when you take a DNA swab as a standard, you take it from the inside of the cheek where you rub the cells off the inside of the cheek. Okay, and a standard or a, it's, you know where the sample comes from? Correct. Go ahead, I'm sorry. The next envelope or bag is um, a white a stain on a blue bed sheet swab. I then have an envelope containing the left hand and the right hand DNA, I'm sorry, this is the DNA card of the victim, the deceased, okay. is taken by the medical examiner. And why is that uh, in a card form? What is the DNA card? Well, the DNA card itself looks like this, and these are swabs of the victim's blood. Where you see the little piece cut out is taken out by the lab to do the testing to eliminate the victim from the other DNA swabs, or to identify the victim in the other DNA swabs. <coughs> This is the right hand. During the autopsy, they take um, the fingernail scrapings. Uh, they clip the fingernails off to see if there's any foreign DNA underneath them. So this is the right hand, and this would be the left hand. So these are right and left hand. And if I open it, they're bindled into a piece of sterile paper, but it's just loose inside that bindle. That's it. Did you also participate in evidence collection and processing of a Cadillac? I did. Okay. And specifically the collection of um, a cell phone from that car? I did. Your Honor, permission to approach? You may. Ms. Hanlon, showing you what's been pre marked as 4C as in Charlie. Take a look at that. Let me know if you recognize that package. 
I do. Okay, does it appear to be altered or tampered with in any way? It does not. Okay, Judge, at this time, state would seek to admit what's been remarked as states 4C uh, as AB1. All right, that'll be admitted as states exhibit 81. And Ms. Hanlon, specifically, can you tell us what's inside of this package? There's um, two things in this package. One is a Samsung cell phone that was taken from the Cadillac, and the other is a Samsung Galaxy Note 5, which I'm not sure if that's the phone, or it's just paperwork. I think it's just paperwork. It feels like paperwork. Okay. Thank you. Your Honor, may I just have one moment? Yes. Nothing further. Thank you, Ms. Hanlon. Any uh, cross-examination? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Go ahead. I just ask you a question about States 81. The question was, has it been altered since you collected it, right? That's correct. Since you put it in here, it has been taken out by fellow officers or Detective Mulberg or somebody, right? It has, yes. Okay. And then you didn't put it back in because you, you're not retired. Right? That's correct. So since you put it in here, it actually has been taken out. It has been taken out, yes. Okay. Now, let me just ask you a few questions about DNA collection, right? You were the supervisor of the unit before you retired, of the crime scene unit? I was, correct. Okay. And the purpose of taking those swabs, right, on different objects is to try to get uh, a sample to later have the lab test for DNA. That is correct. Right? And fingerprints, a similar thing. You're doing the lifts to try to get latents for the lab to compare later. That is correct. All right. So DNA in the 30 years during your career, DNA um, technology has advanced dramatically. Would you agree with that? Yes, it has. And we are at the point now where, where in the past, maybe 30 years ago, all you could really tell from a profile was maybe male or female, but now we're at the point where we can even get just skin cells or sweat cells and be able to match, or, or not match, but compare DNA to, to somebody. That is correct. Right? So even if you were told that a suspect was wearing gloves, for example, you would still try to test objects because the person could have sweat or shed skin cells or shed some other type of fluid saliva onto an object. That is true. Right? Okay. So um, unless somebody is you know, wearing something that's completely covering every part of their body, it's always possible to get DNA at this point where we're at with technology. Yes. Thank you, ma'am. I have nothing further. Any uh, redirect? No, you're on. All right, you may step down. Thank you. All right, the state may call its next witness. They'll call Corey Loder, Your Honor. Corey Loder? What's his name? Corey Loder. All right, if you can please approach the witness stand. When you get there, please remain standing. Raise your right hand to be sworn in, please. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give should be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. You may be seated. Thank you. Can you please state your full name for the record? Yeah, my name is Corey Loder, last name L-O-D-E-R. 
Good morning, Ms. Loader. Good morning. How are you? Good, how are you? Good. Can you tell us where you work? Yeah, I work at Plantation Police Department. How long? Um, I've been there about six and a half years now. What capacity do you work there? Um, for the first five and a little over five and a half years, I was a crime scene tech, and then for the last, or since that point, I've been a latent print examiner. Latent print examiner? Yes. Do you have any schooling to become that? Uh, yeah, I have my bachelor's degree in crime scene investigation, and then I also have a master's degree in uh, criminal justice with a concentration in forensics. <coughs> okay, specifically talking about uh, latent examining, comparing fingerprints, mm -hmm. do you have any specialized uh, courses on that? Yeah, I have a, um, a few 40-hour courses that I've taken over the years um, during my employment, and then a few um, shorter webinars as well. Are you the only latent examiner at the, at the Plantation Police Department now? Um, I'm the only full-time latent examiner. Our manager um, does it when I'm unavailable, and she um, verifies my conclusions as well. So you're the full-time person? Yes. And how many times have you compare latents to known standards? Um, oh, goodness. Over, f I would say over 50, if I had to estimate. Over 50? Yeah. And is your work verified by other people? Yes. Who? Um, our objection to false crime. Overruled. You um, got Our uh, crime scene unit manager will verify. Okay. At this point, I'd like to uh, certify Ms. Loader as an expert in the field of latent print examining. Counter objection to. Uh, let's go sidebar. State may proceed. Well, Ms. Loader, I'm going to show you what's been pre-marked in States 4D for identification. Yes. How do you recognize it? Um, these are the uh, latents of value that I compared. Okay. And there's seems to be a seal on it, is that correct? Yes. Does that have your initials on it? Yes. Other than that, has it been tampered with? No. Okay. At this point, I want to <coughs> move into evidence. You know, I want to look at the three markets, states 4D and states evidence. All right. That'll be admitted as states 82 in evidence. And Ms. Loader, what's inside that envelope? Um, the latents of value that I compared in this case. Okay. You said latents of value, correct? Yes. Now, there's many different latents that are collect collected as part of the investigation. That's correct. <coughs> who makes a determination as to who, what's a value, what's not a value? Um, I do. Okay. And um, you completed a report based on that, is that correct? Yes. Okay. And do you have it in front of you? Yes. Now, there appears to be a number of latents that are associated with a jug of Fabuloso floor cleaner. Is that correct? That's correct. And also of a Glitten paint can. Is that correct? Yes. Um, based on those two, the Fabuloso jug and the Glitten paint can, how many latents were submitted? It was 17. Yeah, 17, yes. And of those 17 latents that were submitted uh, from the Fabuloso jug and the paint can, of those, how many of, were of value? Uh, three. Three. Yeah. <coughs> were you able to compare the ones that are of value to any known standards? Yes. Who's? Um, Eric Robinson and then Isabella Tagliarini. And what, if any, determination were you able to make? Um, two of the latents that were pulled from the Fabuloso jug were identified to um, Ms. Tagliarini. Okay. 
Now, let's move on to the Mr. Mr. Clean latex glove. Uh, there appears to be, how many, how many uh, latents were submitted from the Mr. Clean latex glove packaging? That would be eight. Of those eight, how many were of value? Four. Okay. Were you able to compare that to any known uh, standards? Yes. And what if any result? Um, those four latents of value were not identified to any of the knowns. Moving on to a cell phone which was removed from the Cadillac, were you able to um, were you able to examine any latents that were removed from the cell phone? Yes. And of those, how many were of value? Um, out of six submitted, one was of value. Were you able to compare those to any known standards? Yes. And what result? Uh, they were not identified to the knowns. And moving on to latents which were removed from a journal, mm -hmm. torn, page, torn pages from a journal, mm -hmm. of how many latents were recovered from those? Uh, 26 total were submitted. And out of those 26, how many were of value? Two. And were you able to compare those to any known standards? Yes. Any results? Uh, they were not identified. And moving on to the map of a dump which was recovered from the F-150. Mm -hmm. uh, how many latents were recovered from that map? Three. Of those, how many were of value? One. And were you able to compare it to any known standards? Yes. And any result? They were not identified. Thank you, Ryan. Any um, cross-examination? Yes. Not the, Meaning where the evidence alleged that the suspect came in? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Okay, so no swabs of, of a door? No latents. I'm oh, no. sorry. I, yeah. No latents. No latents. Low latents of a door. Correct. And you, in the past, you've received latents from... Can you object that student in the past, Your Honor? Based on your training and experience... I'll allow it to be asked that way. Is a doorknob or a door an area where latents could be lifted from? Um, it would depend on the surface, a number of things. They could or could not. Okay. It just, it depends. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any redirect? Yes. So you're not sure if there was, if the door was swabbed or if it was of value? Yeah, I'm not sure. Okay. I didn't, so I you, wasn't you at the scene. You look at the ones that are of value, correct? I, yeah, I look at them all, but I wasn't at the scene, so I don't know what the... Thank you. Yeah. All right. Can I just reprocess on that point? On that point, yes. So you received all latents lifted? All the ones that are submitted to me, yeah. There might be some that the crime scene technicians would lift that don't get submitted because they know they're of no value. Okay. So um, they, the crime scene tech, let's say Ms. O'Brien, for example. Sure. Were you there when Ms. O'Brien worked there? Yes. Would she have the expertise to be able to tell if the latents had no value or not, or would they give it to you as the expert? No, it's possible that they would have been able to make that determination. Okay, thank you. All right, you may step down. Thank you. All right, the state may call its next witness. The state will call Danny Haynes.
stands. And when you get there, please remain standing and raise your right hand to be sworn in. I do. My name is Daniel Haynes. D A N I E L H A N E S. Mr. Haynes, uh, where do you work? The Plantation Police Department. How long have you been working there? 16 years. Back in 2017, where you're working there? I was. What capacity? As a detective. Now, as a detective, uh, have you had a chance to take the buccal swabs or the swabs from the defendant, Eric Robinson? I did. I want to approach you with the mark that states 4F. Envelope. Yes, I recognize this. How do you recognize it? Uh, this was the envelope that I placed the swabs in uh, after obtaining them from Ms. Robinson. Now, other than the tape up top of the envelope, which might have been opened by the lab, is there any other tampering of the envelope? Uh, no, there does not appear to be. Okay. This one on Lotus Evans puts some three marks on the state's 4F and state's evidence. All right, that'll be admitted as State's Exhibit 83. Now, Detective Haynes, at this point, at this point, I have no more questions for you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any uh, cross-examination? No, Your Honor. All right, you may step down. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Does State have uh, another witness? Okay, well, then we'll be leaving few minutes early for lunch, I guess. All right. Um, all right, 1.30. So you'll have an extra long lunch today. Uh, let me remind you of previous instructions. You're not to discuss this case with anyone, not even among yourselves. You're not to do any research on your own, go to any places discussed during the course of the um, trial. And of course, should anything be in the media that you think could be related, please avoid it. Everyone have a great lunch. Leave your notebooks at or by your chairs. 1.30 at the reception area, please. Please be, uh, you may be seated. Uh, anything else we need to discuss before we break for lunch? Yes, Your Honor. I would like to discuss um, the court's prior ruling regarding the prior incident between Ms. Tagliarini and Mr. Wilcox. Um, Ms. Tagliarini will be testifying today. I just wanted to add some argument um, and just further kind of enlighten the court as to the whole situation that was going on at the time. Now, I understand the court's ruling about the specific um, incident that occurred between Mr. Wilcox and Ms. Tagliarini for which she called the police. Our position still is that it is not reverse Williams rule, A, because Williams rule is, is meant to say that that act is so similar to this act that she's the person that did it because of that, right? Well, is prior bad acts that are being introduced to prove identity. something, identity, motive, or something um, of that nature? It's, it's typically identity, but so I want to give your honor, if I could, if I could approach yeah. with text messages between Isabella Tagliarini and her ex-husband, Nicholas Tagliarini. <laughs> And I would ask the court to look at them because if the court does not want me getting into the specific incident that had occurred between Ms. Tagliarini and Mr. Wilcox, I still need to emphasize that this evidence strikes to the heart of our defense because it goes to motive. And so 
I am not using that evidence to say that because that happens between them, that that is why Ms. Tagliarini is the one who killed Mr. Wilcox. If you look through these texts, this is Ms. Tagliarini texting her ex-husband, the same ex-husband that she called on October 5th that we've heard about. She's talking about how, and it's September 22nd, right after the incident, um, she's saying that she's going to the hotel, um, her parents are renting for the weekend, that he, meaning Nicholas Wilcox, and again, I'll, I'll get some of this more out in testimony, but just for purposes of this, he doesn't let me in the house. Now this is 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 days before he's killed. Um, if you look at the next page, um, in the next few pages, let me go to, I think, page four in the exhibit that I gave your honor. She's texting that, um, that Nick Wilcox wants money for the truck, which, as we know, it's a truck that was damaged in that incident. Um, he said he will have me arrested if I don't pay his truck. He took my home. He's putting me in the street. Um, then she sends this text on the bottom. It says, I'll find out at lunch. And, and afterward, she says, that's his text to me. But she's saying that Nick Wilcox told her that basically she was threatening to have him arrested, but now you're going to be the one to go to jail. And then there's just further text about the fact that he's been demanding money from her. Um, and you know, there's turmoil there. So again, it goes to the circumstances, which Your Honor let me get into an opening, the circumstance where she had been kicked out. But I, I would ask that I be allowed to go a little deeper into it. I mean, I, of course I want the whole thing in, but if Your Honor's not letting me get into the specific instance, I well, still think the, the fact financial... That they, the, the fact that they had a fight, uh, a ver verbal fight and that he had kicked her out of the house and they were arguing over money. Uh, I don't really necessarily have a problem with that. The issue really is prior acts of violence, particularly anything that would be considered criminal. Uh, but the fact that they were having a rocky relationship, arguing over money, I think that's fair game. Okay, how about the fact though, because again, it's, it's a big deal for, and Nicholas Tagliarini will testify to this, it is a big deal for her immigration if she's arrested. So that was one of the things she was telling him she was very nervous about, was that he was going to have her arrested. So I can't, just like you allowed the state to get into the fact that Mr. Robinson was in jail, which I think could have been, in the words of the state, sanitized out, it was something for the whole complete picture that Your Honor let in. And for this, I think the fact that he's threatening to arrest her, have her arrested, whatever, shows a heightened level of uh, volatility going on in the relationship. So I don't know how I can get into that without, I mean, again, I don't need to get into that she was, and, and I, I disagree that it was a verbal fight because she's smashing Items, so, but well, I agree they didn't physically, there was no physical. Let me put it this way the fact that he wants money because she wrecked his truck, I, I, you know, if, if it stops there, I don't necessarily have a problem with that. It's just you can't get into how she wrecked his truck. How about the fact that he's starting to arrest her? I mean, I can just say that, but what it doesn't make a whole lot of sense without the jury understanding why he would be threatening to have her thrown in jail and, and that level of, of, like I said, volatility. Well, they have a response. Yeah. What we're trying to do here is what the defense is trying to do is paint Isabella Tegrini as a violent person that will do anything to make sure that her immigration status is intact. She had a green card all through this judge. As, as far as the relationship between Eric Roberts and Isabella Tegrini, uh, the reason she was acting the way she was, i.e. not calling the police, i.e. not running away from Eric Robinson when she had a chance to do, is because of prior history of violence. 
I can call the witness, Ms. Ginsburg, that can testify that Eric Robinson was beating her with his fist to her, to her face outside of the apartment. And I think that's relevant as well. I have a video which was taped by Isabella Tagarini where Eric Robinson is fighting with the decedent in this particular case. And at one point, not at one point, at various points, uh, says that he would kill both of them if she does not shut up. But I'm not sure what this has to do with the Well, it has, it has everything. Well, to do. it's an example of why well, he the wants court does. Nelson, but not no, it, it, it's generally he's saying that since uh, he can't use his Williams rule, you shouldn't be able to use your Williams rule. Well, but Let me put it this way. Uh, I don't know. I don't know necessarily that all of this is Williams' rule, but you can't bring in the actual incident itself. Now, if you want to, I guess the issue is, you know, how do we sanitize it if we can? Uh, the fact that they had um, their relationship was a little bit rocky, uh, but but I, I would point out that. When, in relation to the date of the incident, were these texts? Uh, less than two weeks before. Okay, well, apparently they resolved their differences because they were sleeping together. And on that night, well, I mean, you have, you have a witness that says that she was still being excluded from her house. I, up in, I, I mean, uh, otherwise it's really not relevant. You know, if she had, if there were evidence, if there was evidence of something going on at the time of the murder, I mean, if they're sleeping together and their differences are resolved, the fact that they may have had, they may have fought a lot in, in the past, uh, and again, I'm talking verbally, that there were, uh, and I again, or the, that there were prior threats, I'm not seeing. Uh, the issue is, what was the situation at the time that the incident occurred? And if those incidents are resolved, um, then really uh, the, the relevance that there may have been fights as, or arguments as recent as a week or two uh, may not be really relevant. Well, but I will allow you to bring out the fact that they were... That, that, that they argued a lot as long as you don't bring out specific examples or prior incidents. Well, the text, the, the text messages may be able to... Well... The problem is, it's her statements to a third party, and I don't, unless there's some admissions in here, or if it's, I don't know necessarily that this is relevant to the issues at hand, because it, again, it deals really with their argument over the truck, which I am not letting in. So if I'm not letting in the truck incident, the, the text messages really become irrelevant. Here's kind of a snapshot of the well, relationship because they don't even get together until the end of August, right? Within a week, they're doing a marriage contract. Then, I think that was the third. Then two weeks later, they have this incident. Then he's, there's other issues happening. We have a relationship that's not even two months, and we have some severe highs and lows. Well, so regardless of if they're sleeping together that night, and I think the jury can parse that out, I think the fact that this was not a peachy relationship, I mean, let's... let's, let's not, I don't have a problem with you bringing out that it wasn't a peachy relationship. You just can't bring out prior bad acts. Okay. So how about the... the the threats that he's making to her. So let's let's just kind of like envision it, right? Ms. Tagliarini is here, and I say, Ms. Tagliarini, isn't it true that you killed Nicholas Wilcox? No, I would never. I love Nicholas Wilcox. Well, to me, and I, we can address that, I guess, as it comes along, but, you know, somebody threatening the person they're supposed to marry with, you know, arrest, I think, is a pretty severe act. Again, it depends on the when. 
so close in time that well, I think if it, again, you should be able to hear about it to get the full picture of this relationship. If you want to make a proffer and I'll decide whether it's relevant, I, I will decide. But from what I'm hearing, what it sounds like from what, I, what I've heard from both parties this morning is that whatever fight they had over the truck previously where she was locked out of the house, apparently they, uh, they resolved those incidents because they were sleeping together again. So the, the argument that the truck incident is a motive for murder is really uh, no, rather not. rather weakened. No, it's not that the truck incident's a motive for murder. It's the volatility of the relationship. Well, again, that, that murder, then right? it's a, that goes to show that you're asserting that this is a prior bad act that shows she's a violent person, I'm which is... I'm not about the act itself. I'm talking well, about the Well, that she's a violent person is not coming no, in. No, no, no. Not the violent person. I get that. I understand. So, um, again, I don't think... Uh, barring something showing a direct relevance as to why she would want to uh, murder him at, the, at on that date, I don't find that it's relevant and it's not coming in. But I will listen to a proffer, and it, it may be that some of the uh, testimony might be relevant. I don't know. Dep it depends on what I hear. But the prior bad acts are not coming in. You want to hold on to your uh, oh, yeah. photographs? Actually, can you make it a court exhibit? Okay. Make this uh, court exhibit number one. It's just for the um, appellate purposes. It's not for the jury. Okay. All right. And one, one more quick thing, but yes. Um, the, after Ms. Tegarini testifies, um, Ms. Santiago from the Crime Lab is going to testify. Um, part of the evidence that she initially received was uh, a standard from Isabella Tagarini, who was part of a rape kit. Um, I'm going to instruct her not to mention any of those swabs. There's anal swabs, vaginal swabs, swabs of her breasts, things like that. Um, I'm just going to, I'm just asking for permission to kind of lead her and just say, did you receive As to how she got the standards, uh, any objection to the state leading in that area? Okay, then uh, you may do so. And then lastly, Judge, um, I had prepared a stipulation regarding the identity of the deceased victim in the autopsy, um, pre-marked in the state's 4F, and with Mr. Robinson and Ms. Newman have signed it as well as Mr. Sekai. All right. Then we'll, um, at the appropriate time, we'll, you, you can enter that into evidence. Uh, is, is Ms. Taglarini going to be your next witness? Okay. All right. Anything else before we uh, break for lunch? All right. We are in recess until 1.30 p.m.
Defendant is present along with his counsel and counsel for the state. Anything we need to discuss before we get started? case was pending yes, yes. it wasn't before the uh, the incident no, no, no. okay um, obviously I declined their invitation but that was how I found out about it so I did ask Ms. Tagli reading a deposition about it um, her answer about why she wanted to go on the Dr. Phil show was because she wanted to get some type of therapy and she knew that part of being on the show that maybe she would be able to get therapy Okay. So that's, I would like to keep it at that to not, I mean, part of it was she wanted therapy because of what happened. Well, oh, who's going to bring up the fact that she went on Dr. Phil? She didn't go on Dr. Phil, but I was going to ask her about it, about her desire to be on it. And so I'm asking the what, what What is the relevance of that? I mean, let me put it this way. If you ask her about it, then the next, and it opens up the door to the, the why. With you. The why. So, it, it, I think it's totally irrelevant. But if I do allow you to ask it, that means the state gets to ask, you know, why did you do it? Because obviously you're bringing it out because you think that there's some sort of negative connotation of that. Well, I think it's fair to say that for somebody who was so traumatized by an incident, I think it's just a story. Well, there, there are different conclusions you could make. One, you could say that it's it's a bizarre act and maybe she's seeking some sort of type of publicity. The other, another argument could be that she was suffering and needed f free therapy. Uh, and she yeah. thinks Dr. Phil is gonna be the guy to do it. And that's the answer she gave in that position. Okay. So let me put it this way. You get the good with the bad. My feeling is you don't go, you, sh you we probably shouldn't go there because I don't see how it's relevant. But if I d did decide to allow you to go there, I would allow an explanation as to why she would do that or why she actually did it. That's where I was getting. Okay. Um, so what I was asking the court is to continue the motion in limine because her answer at no time was that she was specifically seeking counseling because Eric Robinson had committed domestic violence against her. She allegedly has been a victim of domestic violence in like three different relationships prior to Mr. Robinson. And her specific answer, and if Yarna gives me a minute to find it in the deposition, I will, was that, you know, she wanted counseling or therapy. So I'm well, not... Let, let, let's... That, I, I, th I think that that... You know, I, I, again, as to the underlying psychiatric or, or psychological issues, I think you're going to be opening the door to a whole lot of stuff that we probably should not have in this trial. That's and that's, I, I think that that is a really bad idea. Okay. That's the uh, that's Because I put on the record the video that we have, which is correct? What's that? Yes, twice. Is there anything else that you need a uh, uh, pretrial ruling on or pre a pre-testimony ruling? Uh, well, to continue the issue that we had before lunch, which was Your Honor making the state's argument that it was maybe not relevant. Um, I wasn't time. making the state's argument. I might have been agreeing with the state's no, argument. Never made that argument. It was your honor's argument. Okay. About well, the th time then, 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 then it was my art. It was my. Well, my. I don't make an argument. I make decisions. Uh, Suggested that it was not relevant, which was not the state's objection. 
and then ruled that because of the time frame, it was not relevant. So there is another text message that <coughs> Ms. Tagliarini sent um, on October 3rd, which is two days before. Um, so I don't know if you want to bring her in. You, you told me I could do a proffer with her. I would like to proffer for her anyway. So I just want to ask her about that. An email two days before. Yeah, a text message to the deceased. Uh, two days before, okay. the content of which was me more, but it's M E U, like that's Portuguese. Well, I before know. we do a proffer, what can you tell me what what's in the email or or show me? I'm reading. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Or te excuse me, text message. It's a text. Yeah. Okay. Me more. I really don't know who you are. I am so confused. Lies and more lies. I am sorry, but I feel dumb. Um, so just <clears throat> evidence closer to the date and time that there were issues between the two of them. So you want to read, oh, you know what, as to that, let me hear what your question would be. And again, it, it, uh, no discussion about the prior stuff. It would, uh, it, if I do allow it, it would just be. You sent this email, or excuse me, I keep saying email, this text message. Do you want to bring her in now for me to do all of the proffer stuff? Well, I don't know. What, what other proffer stuff is yes, there? Well, you're excluding the incident itself, so I wanted to ask her about that and the changing of the locks and that whole the prior incident that you've excluded. I was thinking about bringing her in. Just, just not, I instruct her not to talk about any prior, prior domestic violence as of yet, uh, if you want to bring her in, just so... Well, I'm, I'm just, uh, since I've excluded it, I, I think unless there's a dispute as to what she would say. No, I need the questions and answers in the record for the appellate court judge, just in case there's, that's how it should be done. And so the court can, like, you know, any higher court, if, if it gets there, can evaluate the testimony, the questions and answers that I, I would want to elicit not sufficient for me to just proffer the content. What's the state's position on that? I think you're rule judge. <laughs> well, the, the... How did the appellate court well, make a determination as well, to... Number one, you can put on the record the areas that you want to explore. I mean, you already had a opportu an opportunity to do a discovery via, uh, deposition, so you should know what, sh what, what her, what her uh, testimony would be. I'm confused, Judge, though, because I've already told you that I'm bringing in another officer for a proffer. Everybody was, yeah, we're doing, we'll do the proffer tomorrow, so obviously everybody knew. Well, that. I don't know what this officer is going to testify to, I mean, if it, I would allow you to, to put on the record what you believe the officer would testify to. I, I know that that is not sufficient at the appellate level, but if All the right. court is not allowing me to do an adequate proffer, then that's well, what the court is Well, the, the issue is, I'm allowing you to proffer what you believe, what testimony you, or what areas you're going to ask her on. I don't know necessarily that I'm going to let you do an entire discovery deposition on the record. It's like five questions, but I think it's it's the right way to do it, with all due respect, is that the witness is there and I ask the questions and she gives the answers so that at an appellate level it can be seen what was excluded. If Your Honor wants... I, I, I think it's pretty clear what was excluded from, from what you put up, proffered on the record. I'm just trying to decide whether to do the uh, uh, do it after or before. Um, what 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 are the questions you want to ask, and then I'll decide how I want to proceed on that. So. On September 21st, 
2017, two weeks before his murder, Nicholas Wilcox called the police, correct? I know that already. Okay. <laughs> I know that he's objecting to all this. That's the whole point of the proper, right? That it's already been excluded. So. Well, it, it, it's... Okay, so that okay, so so, so Wilcox answer. called the police two weeks earlier. Right. So her answer <coughs> in the record as to what her answer would be if she were here. On that day, you were intoxicated. You drank and took pills that night. You texted somebody, and this again, these these would come out depending on the way she answered her questions. Some of them might not be admissible the way I'm asking them right now, but you texted. Uh, someone named Mike that you had mixed alcohol and Xanax and that when you do that you become a very different person and I would just add as an aside that on this particular night she was doing alcohol and Xanax um, or drinking alcohol and Xanax um, you were smashing things inside of the house you were smashing plates you took a piece of wood and you were smashing the side of Nick Wilcox's F-150 because of that, he had to get a rental vehicle that he was demanding that you pay him um, money to fix the car and that if you didn't pay, he was going to have you arrested. <clears throat> that you were threatening around the same time to have him arrested. What that's for, I'm not clear at, at this point what her answer to that would be. The police on that night made you leave the house. They wouldn't let you stay there. Nick Wilcox also wouldn't let you stay there. Nick changed the locks after that incident, and that was to keep you from coming back into the house, which is what she answered in deposition, that that's when it was changed. You were concerned that if you got arrested, you could lose your status here in this country. Have you ever made a statement different? Well, that's her. Um, you said that to your husband, Nick Wilcox, that would have been part of the impeachment. I'm sorry, Nick, ex-husband, Nick, Nick Tagliarini. Um, that was it as to the incident on September 21st. Okay. Uh, as to um, your proffer, I'm going to assume that the uh, answer to all those questions is yes. And again, my ruling is the same. I find that uh, those items um, or those, those areas of inquiry are inadmissible as uh, number one is prior bad acts or two that is simply irrelevant and uh, to, to the um, incident that has occurred here All right, anything else? Uh, okay. Were you ready to start? Yes, Your Honor. All right, let's bring in the jury. All right, everyone, please be uh, seated. Okay.
All right, let's call our uh, next witness. Right over there. Okay, please remain standing. Raise your right hand, uh, right hand to be sworn in. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give should be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. You may be seated. Okay, have a seat right there. <coughs> Just move in a little bit so you're close enough to the mic to be heard. That's fine. Can you please state your full name for the record? Isabella Tagliarini. And can you spell both first and last name? I S A B E L L A T A G L I A R N I. Thank you. All right, you may proceed on. Good afternoon, Mr. Moreno. Good afternoon. How are you? A little tense, but okay. You want to move up a little bit because the microphone? <coughs> move up a little Speak up. Uh, okay. Better now? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Can you tell us how, how old you are? I'm 44 years old. And where are you from? I'm from Brazil. When did you come to this country? In December of 2010. Do you know the defendant, Eric Robinson? Not at that time. The question, do you know him? Yes, I do. Okay. And back in 2017, you knew him as well, correct? Yes, correct. Uh, back in 2017, August of that year, uh, where were you living? I was living in Plantation. Do you remember the address or no? 72... Oh, one, I'm, I'm not so sure. North Coast 15th Street? Yes, okay. perfect. And back in August of that year, who was living at that location? Back in August? Yes. Uh, it was me, Eric, and Nicholas Wilcox. Nicholas Wilcox. Mm -hmm. And back on August of 2017, how long were you living there? I moved there in July of 2016. Okay. And you and Eric were boyfriend and girlfriend? Yes, we were. And Nicholas Wilcox, when did he move into that apartment? In the middle of June of 2017. And uh, were you dating both of them at that, at that point or no? No. Just Eric? Just Eric. Nicholas was a roommate, correct? It was the roommate. How many bedrooms in that apartment or that house? Three bedrooms. Master bedroom? A master bedroom, a bathroom inside, and then two other, bed, uh, two other bedrooms and a bathroom. So Nicholas would have his own bedroom? Yes, of course. And did you share a bedroom with Eric? 
Yes, yes. we do. Specifically in August of that year, were you sharing a bedroom with Eric? Yes, I was. Okay. Now at one point, uh, the defendant went to jail, correct? Yes, he did. Okay. Prior to him going to jail, were you still dating him? We were still officially together, but... Minor objection? Sustained. Uh, rephrase your question. Prior to the defendant going to jail, were you dating Eric Robinson? Yes. Okay. And what is your relationship with Nicholas at that point? We were friends. I was working for him. <coughs> you mentioned that you were working for him. Yes, I was working for him. What did Nicholas Wilcox do for a living? He was a general contractor. Are you a general contractor? No, I'm not. Okay. How would you be working for him? Um, he offered me the job in the beginning to tape and to clean the places where he was working. And the majority of the time, which county were you working in? Uh, we were in West Palm Beach, so Palm Beach County. Palm Beach County. Mm -hmm. After the defendant, Eric Robinson, went to jail, did you stay in the apartment? Yes, I did. Did Nicholas Wilcox stay in the apartment? Yes, he did. Okay. At any point, did you develop a relationship with Nicholas Wilcox? Yes. Uh, how long did it take? It take um, maybe three weeks. Okay. And uh, did you have any communication with Eric Robinson at that point? No, I didn't. You moved on to Nicholas Wilcox. I'm sorry? You moved on to Nicholas Wilcox? Yes. Um, <clears throat> drawing your attention to October of that year, um, did you personally have any knowledge of when Eric Robinson was supposed to get out of jail? No. Drawing your attention to October 5th of that year, Remember that date? Yes, I do. The morning of that date? I do. Okay. Uh, the morning of October 5th, were you sleeping in the same bed as Nicholas Wilcox? Yes, we were. Uh, what if anything awoke you? What woke me up? Yeah. I woke up with Eric holding my mouth and my neck and then I opened my eyes, the television was still on and the, t the lights were on. Okay. You saw Eric on top of you or was he on top of somebody else? He was on top of me. Well, at that moment, uh, Eric made a question, not asking if I want to leave or die, and also telling me to be quiet, continue holding. I couldn't turn my head to any side, and I could hear Nicholas Wilcox struggling to breathe. was a noise that will never leave my mind forever, horrible, of a person struggling. I couldn't see him, but I w he was struggling. Terrible noise, like a, <laughs> a noise like this. What happened after that? Um, in my mind, I thought that, that Nick was gagged or I didn't know he was hurt. Then Eric walked me out of the bed until out around the bed, I couldn't see Nick. At a glimpse of my eyes, I saw something on his face. 
that looked like blood. Right. And Eric took me to the living room that was in front of our bedroom, sat me down, and he was telling me that he was still not sure if he was going to kill me too, asking uh, why I cheated on him and stayed with Nicholas Wilcox. And we could still listen Nicholas trying to breathe and he said that he had to finish his job. Now let me <coughs> interrupt you for a second there. Okay. Uh, prior to you waking up with the defendant on top of you holding your mouth, <coughs> when's the last time you spoke to Eric Robinson? In person was the, in the morning, he was going to the court, and from there, he was arrested. And <coughs> after that, he went to jail, and the first time you saw him was that morning, correct? Yes. Now, you mentioned that he took you out of the bedroom. How did he take you out of the bedroom? Continue holding my mouth and taking the cover over me, walking with me. And, to, and made me sit in the floor. Now, did you ever see him re-enter the bedroom? Eric? Yes. Yes, I was sitting right in, in at the door and he, he went back. What, he, did you see what he did? Yes. Can you tell the jury what you saw? He had a big piece of of um, a metal, dark metal, like, uh, I didn't know the name before, but it was a big metal, and he was, he, he was doing, like, hitting him several times, and saying, die, motherfucker, die, motherfucker, and and that's, that's what he was doing until the noise disappeared. How did you react? I couldn't look. I was so afraid, so scared, because I knew I was going to be the next. What time of night was this? Uh, in my belief, it was 2.30, because as the television was on, there was the time there, so I saw. 2.30 in the morning. Okay. What happens next? He continued talking to me, making questions. He told me, where is your medications for anxiety and depression? I said, it's inside the bedroom in the same drawer. So he told me, he got, gave me, told me to take four bars and then have some, some vodka so I could calm down and probably he could take control of my actions after that. You mentioned that he used a metal or something you said you didn't know the name of before. Do you know the name of it now? Yes, uh, I know now as a crowbar. Do you know what happened to that crowbar? No, I don't know. What's he didn't the, tell me. What's the last time you saw that crowbar? The last time I saw was when we walked outside the house to the back side that there is a pool and was in the left side, hanging to the door. There was a plastic and some blood. That was the last time he told me not to touch. Now, you mentioned that this happened around, you said 2.30 in the morning, right? Yes. Now, what happened between 2.30 and when the sun comes up? What's, what's going on? Um, he, uh, Eric was preparing 
asking me if there was any, Eric asking me if there was, where were there was black um, bags or something else, and he, and somehow he came up with a tarp, silver tarp. Now, where did you get the silver tarp? I believe it was in the house because that was Nicholas' job. Mm -hmm. He was putting tarps in the roofs, in the roof of the houses because there was a hurricane. As, as a sidetrack, and I'll get back to the story, mm -hmm. <coughs> do you remember what kind of vehicle Nicholas was driving at this point? He was, he was driving a, a pickup, like a, I don't know the name, it was a big truck. What color? Silver. Silver? Uh, dark silver. Dark silver. Mm -hmm. Let's get back to what happened between 2.30 and as the sun's coming up. You mentioned the tarp, correct? Yes, the tarp. Now, what's, what, what was the tarp used for? He, Eric used to wrap Nick inside this tarp. Now, to your knowledge, when he was beating the decedent, Nicholas Wilcox, Nicholas Wilcox was still on the bed, correct? Yes, he was sleeping before. Mm -hmm. How did Nicholas Wilcox, the decedent, uh, get off the bed and into the tarp? I didn't see that happening. And because of all the trauma, there are moments that it's some black in my mind. But I, I believe he just put him next to the tarp in the floor and took it off. Do you think you helped him? To put the body in the tarp? No, I didn't touch the body. Okay. And do you remember how the tarp was wrapped? Yes, I do. Tell us. He, he wrapped it like a burrito and he put two belts, one around the, the neck and one around the, the, the foot, the feet. Who's belts? I remember one of the belts, Eric mentioning oh, the motherfucker was using my belt, the other, I don't know, was around the house. Did you have your cell phone on him? At that moment, yeah. no. Did you have a cell phone in the house? Yes, I did. Did you call the police? No, I didn't. Why not? I was too scared. Uh, as he's doing this, where are you in the apartment? Next to him. I could never leave his sight. That was his <clears throat> mandatory order to stay next to him. Now, Ms. Tagliarini, inside the bedroom where where uh, Nicholas Wilcox was murdered. Mm -hmm. Was there any blood in that bedroom? There was a lot of blood. Where? In the bed, in the walls, in the roof. Specifically talking about on the roof, what kind of, what kind of blood was there? Like splatters. Okay. At any point did uh, the defendant there, Robinson, say anything about that? Later in the day, he wanted to clean and wanted to clean all that. Now, at one point, the body is wrapped, like you said, as a burrito inside the tarp, correct? Correct. Uh, what happens next? Then he had to drag the body outside. Okay. And in one moment, Right, uh, he dragged the body from the living room, from the bedroom to the living room, opening the door to go to the the pool. There was a grass, and he asked in one moment for me to help him because I believe it was stuck was too heavy. He even said that. The body. Yes. And he finished going to 
direction of the gate. There was a gate in the back, and he put the body there. Now, you mentioned the gate. Where is the truck at this point? I saw the truck was back in... The truck was... It was in in the gate. The the gate was open, and he and the, and the truck was inside, but not completely, just part. Who put the truck there? Eric. Well, let me ask you this. <coughs> At one point, Eric is outside, and he's putting the body in the truck. Yes. Uh, there's a front door to the apartment, correct? Correct. You could open it. Could you open it? Uh, uh, oh. Could you open it? I could have opened, but I couldn't in my mind. I was always scared to leave him. Once the body is in the truck, what happens next? He came back and he he said he had to go back to the house where he was staying. He told a name of a person, a male. He was staying there. He had to go before this person awake because he was using this person's car. He left you alone. He left me alone. How long? Not that much. I don't remember. I was so in shock. All he asked me was to try to pick all the clothes from Nick and put in bags uh, while he was gone. When he said, when you said that he left you alone, <coughs> how long, and I asked that question, but are we talking about minutes? Are we talking about a half an hour? Are we talking about an hour? I believe half an hour to an hour. And he left? He left. In what car? I don't know. The whole house was covered with, because of the hurricane, with plywood. I had no access to see through the windows. Did you see the truck backed up to the backed up to the gate? Yes, because I went outside in in the grass, so that's where I could see. So you left the body in the truck, and the truck backed up. I don't understand. Well, you mentioned that the truck was backed up to the gate, correct? Correct. And you also mentioned that you put the body in the truck, correct? Yes. And that he left, correct? Yes, he went back with me in the house, gave, told me what to do, and, and left. I don't know, car, I don't You don't know what car he left? No. <coughs> and um, did you do as you were told? Yes, I did. What did you do? I started going on, on Nick's bedroom and picking the clothes and putting in a in a plastic bag like he told me. Okay. And you had access to your cell phone? I didn't know where it was because as soon as I woke up he told me don't want, don't worry about the cell phone. I took both of your cell phones, mine and Nick's. So at that time I had no idea where the cell phone was. At which point did you find it? Why I went back to to the bedroom and then was somewhere there was not in where I left. I left plugging in the wall on the floor. But it's safe to say you found your cell phone. I found my cell phone. While he was away, correct? Yes. Did you call the police? No, I didn't call the police. Why? I objection asked and answer. <clears throat> Yes. I was so scared, so afraid, and I didn't trust the police at that time <coughs> at all. While he's away, and he told you that, and correct me if I'm wrong, you said that he went to Chris's house, correct? Chris's house. <coughs> you were putting together Nicholas's clothes, correct? Yes, I was putting... Mm -hmm. Did you put them in garbage bags? In garbage, yes. Who told you to do this? Eric told me. At which point does he come back? Oh, 
he came he came back was maybe one hour after the most between half an hour to an hour after he came back and do you remember what car he came back in no when he came back what happened um he asked me to to wear some lingeries and be sexy. He wanted to have sex with me. Did you? I did to survive. This was right after he came back, correct? Right after he came back. Um, what happened afterwards? We changed it. And that's a lot, uh, that's where because looking now I know a lot of things they still are so blurry in my mind. Believe it because of home education, all trauma, seeing my fiance being killed there. But I know that we went out from the house. He he said he needed to go to the courthouse. Let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. At one point, you ended up at the Publix, which is right by the courthouse here, correct? Correct. How did you get there? In my memory, I got there inside his car, inside, inside the truck that we were. That's how I remembered. Is that true? No. How did you get there? With his car. Cadillac. You were driving. I saw the video and I agree I was driving. Okay. Now when you got to Publix, he left you alone at Publix, correct? Yes, he did. And what time of, what time of day was that? Around 8 o'clock, probably. People everywhere? Yes. And he left alone on the aisle? He left me alone, yes. And then he came back, correct? And then he came back. You had an opportunity to grab a stranger, grab a security guard, um, maybe even use the courtesy phone to call the police, correct? I had, but I didn't because I was so scared to be killed after he, he made it very clear. Any, any, anything I did, he would kill me. Even said he was gonna kill my kids in Brazil. We had connections. I'm gonna show you a CD, okay? Okay, okay. You had a chance to view some surveillance CD, correct? Correct. <coughs> and I'm going to show you one that's marked 4 g I want you to take a look at this. Tell me if you recognize it. It's the, the public surveillance. You recognize it? Yes, I do. And that's the one that you viewed, correct? Yes. And does it accurately reflect uh, and show you and Eric at the public that we're talking about? Yes. Does it appear to be altered in any way? No. At this point, I want to move it to evidence. What's more, it's 4G, Your Honor, state's evidence. All right, that'll be admitted. Uh, I think we're up to 84, correct? Yes. So that'll be uh, state's exhibit 84. Permission to publish. We publish.
type reading, if you bear with me, because this is kind of a system that plays all the videos at once. Okay. Who's this? That's me. That's you. Mm -hmm. And you're by yourself pushing in a cart, correct? Correct. What are you shopping for? I wasn't shopping. I was just waiting him come back. Green, who is this? That's Eric. So he comes back <coughs> approximately six minutes later? Yes, it was very quick.
name is Tagarini. Yes. Yes. This is you again? Yes, that's me. This is you and him together, correct? Correct. <coughs> as you're it, as you're in the Publix, are you communicating as to where you are trying to find each other? If you remember. I don't remember. But do you think you have your cell phone? Yes. Do you remember what you're talking about at this point? No, I don't. Tagarini, it appears, and correct me if I'm wrong, you appear to be hugging him, correct? Correct. Can you explain that? I was afraid and I have to make him very sure that I was going to, to be on his side and do whatever he told me, that I was not going to run away. I was going to tell everything he told me to do. Buy anything at Publix? No. Now, <coughs> at the bottom of this video, and it's not very clear on this screen, but it, and correct me if I'm wrong, you can probably see it on your screen there because it's smaller. Uh, it says. October 5th, 2017, 8.33, correct? Correct. To your knowledge, is that time correct? Yes. Okay. Ms. Tagarini, where is Nicholas Wilcox's body at this point? I believe it's in the trunk of his truck. Next to the plantation apartment? Or yes. Where did you go after this? I believe we went to the house. <coughs> what happened to the house? We changed cars. You changed cars? Yes. From the Cadillac? From the Cadillac. To the truck. To the truck. Who was driving the truck? Eric. You were in the passenger seat? Yes, I am. And where did you go? If you remember. I don't remember exactly the route, but I know he was looking for a place to dispose the body. Okay. Do um, you remember going to a couple different stores at least? Stores? Yes. Yes. I just don't remember a timeline. 
remember going to Big Lots? I do. And you went there with Eric? Yes. Driving the pickup. I, be I believe, yes. <coughs> I'm going to show you what's in pre market states 4H. And this is a big loss video. You had a chance to view this as well, correct? Yes, I did. And it, it actually reflects uh, <coughs> you and Eric at big lots, correct? Yeah, big lots. Does lots. it appear to be altered in any way? No. Oh, okay. At this point, I'm going to evidence what's in market states 4H, Your Honor, states evidence. Right, that'll be admitted as states 85. Permission to publish, Your Honor. They publish. Come sidebar. Is overruled. That'll be admitted as States Exhibit 85. Permission. Yes, Public. 
about one minute because it doesn't let me do it exactly. That's fine. Staggering, who is this? Excuse me? Who is this that we see on the screen? That's Eric, and it's me. And that's at the big lots? Yes, correct. What's the purpose of you going to big lots, do you know? Eric wanted to buy cleaning supplies to clean the bedroom. And this be Eric? Yes. Do you remember what you were discussing? No. What is he buying here? The yeah. oxide. Why peroxide, if you know? Well, I know he used before with me. Um, sometimes when <coughs> I was on my period and we had sex and there was blood in in the sheets, he used peroxide to clean. Do you know what you brought him? I, don't, I believe it's a sponge. Sponge. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure.
now Ms. Tagrini, <coughs> after leaving Big Lots with the painting supplies and the peroxide, do you remember where you went next? <coughs> Watching this, I'm this, sorry, watching this and seeing the album, probably that's when we went to the house. You went to the house, I think we did. Went to the house. I already told all the medication, all the alcohol, all the trauma of seeing somebody killing, and the fear I had blurries in my mind. So, you think you went. Back home and change cars after big lots. Yes. Okay. After you change cars, do you remember where you went? I remember going to a place where <coughs> it's like a it's a big this garbage disposal. The dump. The dump. Yes. Whose idea was the good dump? Eric. Okay. I not even knew that they had that kind of place. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you got to the dump, you were sitting in the passenger seat? Yes, I was. And Eric was sitting in the driver's seat? In the driver, yes. And at one point, and the jury has an, had an opportunity to see the video of the interaction between mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Robinson and the person working on the dump, <coughs> it appears that at one point, Eric Robinson gives his driver's license. Yes, he was asked for his driver's license. Did he comment anything about that? No. No? And what happened with the dump? He drove all the way up. There it was a long, was not a long ride, but it was uphill. Okay. And he got there, got out of the truck, and there was a lot of people. A lot of people in other cars and people there, but I don't know what they were doing. So he told that it was not a good place to throw, So, but he had to throw some things that were in, in the back of the truck. Mm -hmm. I believe some bags. Okay. I didn't see, I didn't get out of the car. Sure. And then what? Then he drove back to the exit. And then, at that moment, he was talking again to the person in the, in the window, and he was asking directions to this person. Directions to where? He was asking directions to Naples. And um, the body is still in the back of the truck? Yes, it was. Okay. And... Uh was, was he asking for directions to Naples or the Everglades? He was telling me that he was going to Everglades while we were waiting to get. And then he started asking some Naples questions, but he also needed directions for Everglades. After leaving the garbage dump, do you remember where you went? He asked me to Google my cell phone, Everglades. Okay. Did you? I did. And? And we followed what I was saying there, and he drove for a long time. Do you remember if you took Highway 27 or if you took uh, Alligator Alley? I really don't know. Okay. Can you describe it? Was it a two-lane highway or? It was a two-lane highway. Okay. A lot of was raining too much. There were places with small rivers or some kind of lakes. Okay. He stopped in some of them to look if it was a good place for him to throw the body there. To what? To throw, to put the body there, to throw the body. Okay. Dispose, I don't know. And but he didn't find any any place. No no place was good enough. No no place was good for him. So after driving for a while, we drove. Even raining, he decided to turn back and go back towards the our 
our place, plantation. Plantation. Mm -hmm. When you got close to plantation, did, did you stop anywhere? No. Uh, did you get rid of the body anywhere? Yeah, yes. Where? Um, behind the Publix. Now, Ms. Tagarini, you mentioned that Mr. Robinson wanted to get rid of the body at the dump, correct? Yes. And you drove all the way to the Everett Ways, correct? Yes. Why would you go back to plantation and dump the body there, if you know? I believe because he couldn't find a place that where there was nobody in the Everglades was they already people could see him. <coughs> How close to your house was the body disposed of? I know that place because I live it around there, so I believe around ten minutes or fifteen minutes. Is it the public plaza? Yes. To the house in plantation. To the house in plantation. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to show you what's going to be marked as 4i. <clears throat> and you had a chance to view this video, correct? Yes, correct. <laughs> and surveillance of the garbage close to the public? Yes, I did. It's correct. And it accurately reflects and shows your vehicle, the F-150, correct? Correct. Does it seem to be altered in any way? No. At this point, I want to move into evidence of what's been pre-marked as states 4i, states evidence, Your Honor. All right, that'll be admitted as states exhibit 86 in evidence. Ms. Tagarini, you saw the video before, correct? Yes, I did. What, what is the video of? This is, a, this is the street behind Publix, where there are some cars and some dumpsters there. And that's the dumpster where the body was? Exactly. Okay. And correct me if I'm wrong, but... Okay. Would this be the dumps that we're talking about? Did you know? Yes. <coughs> Who's driving this one? Eric.
see that car? Yes, I see. Yes, I do. Sorry. Whose car is that? That's Nick Wilcox's truck. Now, it appears that it drove by the dumpster, correct? Correct. Why is that? I don't know. Okay. appears to be driving back towards the dumpster, correct? Correct. What's happening now? He's Eric is backing up the truck. the truck yeah. to the end to to the front of the dumpster. <coughs> Did you help Eric remove the body from the truck and place it in the dumpster? No. Did he ask you? No. Okay. I stayed inside the car, sitting down. Now, there appears to be some traffic, foot traffic, cars around, and it's the middle of the day. Weren't you scared? I was scared of Eric. Do you see the clock there? It says 12.23? Yes, I do. To your knowledge, is that accurate? Yes.
Ms. Tigerini, after, after the body is dumped, what happens? We went back to the house. Is the truck leaving, correct? Yes, it is. You mentioned that Mr. Robinson told you that he was staying at Chris's house, correct? Yes, Chris's house. Did you later on find out that he was staying somewhere else? Uh, just lately. When you got back to the house, what happened? When we got back? Yes. Um, Eric took off his clothes, lay down on the couch where it was his favorite place, like nothing had happened. Okay. Asked me to make some breakfast for him, I did. And uh, we went to the bedroom to start cleaning. There was a mattress on the bed, correct? A, a, a mattress? Yes. yes. And it was full of blood? Completely full. What happened to that mattress? Oh, Eric cut pieces of the mattress and he was disposing in the dumpster that was one one block away Did from... Did you go with him? No, no, I didn't go. He just told. That was his previous idea of throwing the body. That he happened. told me that. Um, who did the painting inside the house? We both, but most was me. And again, when he's going to the dumpster to get rid of the mattress, you have your phone on you, correct? Yes, the phone was in the house. There's neighbors around. You could probably knock on their front door, correct? Correct. Why didn't you? Objection. Asked and answered. <clears throat> yes. You can answer. Because I was scared to death to be the next one to be killed like that. And um, may I say something? No, let me ask the question. Okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, only answer what's asked in the questions. Sorry. Okay. That it? Can I have one more draw? Yes. Tigerini. Yes. Um, you were texting with Eric Robinson using <coughs> using uh, Messenger, correct? Correct. What kind of things were you texting? During the day? Yeah, that day. Yes. When he was gone. When he was gone, I was texting him about my feelings. I was asking him if he was if he was still in love with me, if he was going to marry me. Because I, I, I never knew what time he was going to come back or if he was outside. I had to make sure that I was so, so scared and so afraid that I had to make sure that he was not going to kill me. Like he said. You asked him to marry you? I said yes, if he was going to marry me. Okay. One second. Now, you told the police where told the police where uh, 
the body was located, correct? Yes. You told the police where the mattress was located, correct? Yes, I did. You gave a number of statements to the police? Yes, I did. And uh, at one point you were arrested, correct? Yes, I was. Um, and the police showed you these surveillance videos, correct? Correct. Do you remember what you told them? I told them the truth, that I can see that that's what was happening. Mm -hmm. But in my mind, I had another picture, another imagi imagination, another blurry, how my brain process was different. But I never intentionally lied to them. And uh, do you have family in this country? No. Do you have family in this country? No, I'm alone here. And uh, eventually you were arrested, correct? Yes, I was. And you were charged with? Uh, Acc accessory after the f murder. After the fact, sorry. And you chose to be open to a judge on a lesser charge, correct? Correct. And bring with evidence? Correct. And uh, were you promised anything? No, nothing. Uh, were you promised no prison time? No. Would you like prison time? No. I can have two minutes here on it. You see the person that murdered Nicholas Wilcox in the courtroom today? Yes, I do. You, you have to look. You see him? Yes. It's him there. In Can you point him out using an article of clothing he's wearing or not wearing? He's wearing a... I think it's a navy blue um, suit. No, no tie. But the record of of defendant Eric Robinson, Your Honor. Right, you may proceed. Thank you. I have All right, we've been going for a while now. Now it's probably a good time to take a break. Uh, please leave your notebooks at or by your chairs. Deputy, I'll take you back in the jury room. Break. Um, Ms. Tagarini, if you want to wait outside the hallway, you can do so. Okay. Oh, and if you need to use.
seat on the stand will be with you in just a minute. I'm guessing probably not. Okay, next. So, uh, any, I don't know, I'm not particularly feeling optimistic. Uh, if we can bring in the jury, please, and let the record reflect that the defendant is present along with his counsel. Counsel will stand. Everyone, please be seated. We're ready to continue uh, cross examination. Thank you. Good afternoon, Ms. Hagen. Good afternoon. Let's start with how. The state ended okay so let's start with you were charged with a more serious crime you wound up pleading or taking a plea to a lesser charge correct yes okay. now I know that the state just asked you do you want to go to prison you could be facing prison right right but realistically you don't expect to do any jail time correct I don't know. I don't want. Not that you don't want to. Do you expect to? Nothing was promised to me, so I don't have that answer correctly for have you. you. Ever, have you ever made a statement different than that? Maybe yes, that I don't want to go to jail. Okay. Um, you want your permission to approach? Yeah. Okay, Ms. Tidley Now. In this case, you've given a lot of statements, correct? Yes, correct. So you gave, 
I believe, five separate statements to Plantation Police Department, correct? I'm not sure. But you spoke to them many times? Many times. Okay. You were in that interview room? So many times. Lot. And you also came to my office and gave me a deposition. We had to start it and stop it. So it was one deposition, but two separate times, correct? Correct. Okay. Do you remember uh, coming to my office? It was in December, December 15th, 2022. I do. Okay. Do you remember that there was a court reporter there, much like this young lady next to you on the right, who swore you in? I do. Okay. Just like Judge Bober did, right? Yes. And also, just like you did for the plantation police, every time they took a statement from you, from you, you swore to tell the truth, right? Yes. Okay. So I am approaching with the deposition from December 15, 2022, um, page 42. I'll show you page 42. Okay. okay. You right. you mm -hmm. I'm asked already. Um, now, read it to yourself, not out loud. Mm -hmm. um, start on, on line 11 mm -hmm. and end on line 16. So when I asked you that same question, what do you think will happen after you testify in this case? Do you expect to get any jail time? Your answer was... Judge, I'm going to object this to reading. She should have an opportunity to refresh her recollection. Well, I'm going to give, on this question, just, just read it. So your answer was, the expectation is not to go to jail because I didn't commit any crime, right? Correct. Okay. All right, so you were arrested eventually in this case on October 14th, 2017? Yes. Okay. And you went to jail? Yes. Right? For four days, correct? I believe so. Okay. And that is the most you've done in this case. You haven't been in jail since. So you went in October 14th. Since around October 18th, 2017, you have been out of jail. Yes, I was one year in house arrest with an income bracelet, okay. but never in jail anymore. Okay. So you testified just now on direct examination that Eric Robinson went to jail on, on August 23rd, 2017, correct? Correct. And you said that it took about three weeks for you and Nick Wilcox to uh, get into a relationship, right? Yes. Do you recall that you and Nicholas Wilcox drew up a marriage contract? We never drew a marriage contract. We wrote a love letter together. Actually, he wrote it. It's his handwriting. Okay. So he wrote up a document, right? You're, you're saying it's not a contract, um, but it was him promising to marry you. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. um, promising that you two would have children. Yes. That he would make you happy every day of your life except for 10% and that he would give 90% that you're right. Yes. Okay. And you and Nicholas signed, or Nick, you and Nick signed this document and, both, and both put your blood on it to seal it. Yes. Right? Um, do you remember the date that you drew up that document? No, I don't. Right, you don't recall. Would me showing it to you refresh your recollection? Yes, you can show me. Can you show okay. the what is the date on the bottom of that document? September 3rd, 
2017, right? 2017. Okay, so if Eric Robinson, I'm no math scholar, but if Eric Robinson went to jail on August 23rd, this is about 10 days later, right? Almost two weeks, yes. Okay, mm -hmm. but you testified on direct that you and Nick Wilcox didn't even get into a relationship until three weeks after Eric went to jail, right? That's what I believed was all that time, but Okay. That doesn't make a big difference was after. Okay. In fact, you and Nick Wilcox actually became romantically involved immediately after Eric went to jail, correct? Not immediately. We were really friends, but not immediately. So, at the time that Nick died, on October 5th, 2017. You and he had been in a relationship for maybe a month, correct? Uh, when he died? When he died on October 5th. If you guys got together sometime, I mean, you're already agreeing to marry each other on September 3rd. So we're talking about, let's say a month, give or take? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And around September 22nd, 2017, there was a time where you and Nick Wilcox were, uh, let's just say, not getting along, right? We had a verbal fight. It was a fight that was serious enough that he made you stay at a hotel and not come back home. Okay, I'm sidebar. It was a fight serious enough that he uh, wouldn't let you come back home and you had to stay at a hotel. Right? It, it was a fight and I was offered to stay so we could calm down and talk to the other day. I'm sorry. So I stayed in a hotel. I'm sorry, say that? I didn't quite understand. I, I understood it. So, next question. Okay. Um, your parents got you a hotel room. I paid my hotel room. Okay. Did Nick allow you to come back home? In the next day, yes. Okay. But there was a period of time where he did not want you back home. Yes. Okay. And... Additionally, I'm sorry, may I just have one moment? Yes. And there was also a point where he was demanding Money from you. Josh, I'm going to object to that. Who say? Can we come to Yeah.
right, I am uh, sustaining the objection on, on that last question. Um, and uh, you are to disregard the question and any response uh, that may have been made to it. Let's move on. You and Nick Wilcox were having issues on October 3rd, were you not? Issues? Were you having issues in your relationship? Was there a point where um, you felt you didn't know who he was anymore and <coughs> he was lying to you? I think that it was for a normal couple, insecurity or fight, something or discussion that happened. Do you remember what Nick Wilcox's phone number was? No. Okay. What, if I said it, would you maybe know what it was? Or no? Because no, I'd say because I always die, uh, press his number, his name. Okay. Are you aware that the police took uh, phones into evidence, Nick's phone? Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. They also took your phone. Yes. Okay, we'll get back to that later. But have you talked to the police about text messages that were relayed between you and Nick Wilcox? Not getting into what they were, but did you ever review them? They didn't show me anything. Okay. Um, they, of course, we had text messages, but they didn't show me anyone. Okay, so your recollection right now is that there was nothing really going on in your relationship between you and Nicholas Wilcox on October 3rd, 2017. Yes. Okay. Now let's, I'm getting to it sooner than I thought. I said we'll get to that later, but now is later. So let's talk about the devices, the, the phones and things that you had and Eric had and mm -hmm. Nick had. Back in 2017, you were using an iPhone, right? Yes. And Nicholas Wilcox had a Motorola. I right? knew so. Mm -hmm. And Eric Robinson had a few different, I think they were Samsung's Android cell phones. I saw, I just knew he had one cell phone. Against the wall. Can you touch? Of can I bring it close? Yeah, yeah. No, you can hold it. Okay. Uh, those are to click this computer from computer computer screens. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Was there a computer attached to those? Yes, yes. there was a, a Mac. Okay. A mini Mac computer attached to that. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what is this a picture of? This is a picture of the nightstand, on the top some belongings of mine, and right, right here is my, my, oh my, God, my iPad. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, also from the residence when the police came in and photographed it, was that Eric's phone? I really don't know if it was his or Nick's. Okay, that wasn't your phone though? No. Okay. Now, your iPhone was taken from you by the police on which day, do you remember? 
As soon as they came to the house, the only person I answered, they let me answer was my parents, and then they took it. After that, I never had access to that anymore. Okay, so while you were in the interview rooms, you did not have your cell phone to your recollection? No. And at the end of the day, at around five o'clock or so, you had reached out to your ex-husband, Nick Tagliarini, right? Correct. Correct. Um, now, you told the police that you had no issue with them going through your iPhone, correct? Do you remember that? Yes. Okay. But it turns out they weren't able to get into your phone because you weren't able to provide a password. Do you remember that? I provided them the password and I also put my finger, that's how that cell phone worked. You put your finger print and was not opening. Why? I don't know. I didn't. I, I provided them all okay. passwords possible. Okay, so your phone was working during the day on October 5th. You were able to use it, right? Yes. And it was working at around 5 o'clock when you called Nick Tagliarini. Yes. Right? But when the police, when you agreed to let the police go in your phone, all of a sudden your thumbprint or your password was no longer working to give them access to that phone. Right? Correct. Okay. Now let's fast forward to, or rewind, um, to October 5th, 2017. I'm sorry, no, not October 5th. October 2nd through October 5th, before you say Eric came into the house. Okay? Yes. You... Notice that Eric's Cadillac had been gone from the house, um, maybe about October 2nd or 3rd? Right? Yes, when we came back from work around 8.30, 9 o'clock, I didn't see the car. And you're aware that Eric owned that car, right? Versus leasing it? He was paying the car, yes. Okay, you're not sure if it was a lease or, or owned? No. Okay. And you're aware that the way he paid for that car was it would automatically deduct from the bank account that I think you guys shared at one point, correct? No, I was not aware of that. You're not aware of that? Okay. No. And when did you notice that, or let me, let me ask it a different way. The, the letter, the contract that I had shown you, right, or I know you don't call it a contract, the marriage document, whatever, mm -hmm. um, that wound up gone from your house, correct? I didn't notice that it was gone. I was told by Eric that he took it with him when he was in the house while we were working. So, you did not notice, so the, the question is, you did not notice that it was gone at any point? No, I didn't notice. Okay. And now let's talk about the night of October 5th, or the very early morning hours, right? Okay. So, your testimony is that you are asleep in bed with Nick Wilcox, right? Correct. And that you awakened <clears throat> to Eric Robinson using both of his hands on you, right? Yes. Okay. So you're saying he had one hand on your, I believe, throat? Yes, on my neck, on my throat. And the other hand on your mouth? Yes. And prior to that, you were sound asleep. Yes, I was. And the house has, has an alarm that like chimes when the door is open. Do you recall that? Yes. Okay, that didn't wake you up, right? No, the door was closed from the, the, from the bedroom. So when you are 
Awaken, Awoken, by Eric. Okay. It becomes apparent to you that Nick Wilcox has already been severely injured, right? No. Okay, well, you said there's a sound coming from him that you'll never forget, that you can hear him um, like gurgling for, for breath. Yes. Right? So something has happened to him at that point, right? Yes. Something that is keeping him from being able to breathe. Yes, I thought he was being gagged. I would never imagine that he was hurt. And when you just kind of out of the corner of your eye or when you're walking, whatever, you can already see that there's blood. Yes, right? I could see there was blood in his face. Okay. And it's at that point that um, Eric makes you sit outside the door. Exactly. Okay. Now, there was some discussion on direct examination about you having your phone, right? Now, at this point, when you're sitting outside, Eric takes your phone from you, right? Not at that point. He told me, don't, have, don't bother to look. I took both of your cell phones because my cell phone was always plugged in the wall next to me. So he just mentioned that. So I know I didn't have the, the, the cell phone. And you've stated that, not on direct, but you've stated that Eric had your phone the entire day, correct? Yes, I made that comment, not intentionally, because in my mind I felt like he had. So let's talk about that for a minute. Um, before we get to that, actually, let me back up a minute. Do you remember what your phone number was back in October 2017? I believe it's the same one until now. Okay, what would that number be? Well, right now it's 954-994-9646. admitted that you told the police that Eric had taken or that you told them that Eric had taken your phone the entire day right yes okay you didn't tell them that once you actually threw out multiple statements told them that Eric had your phone and you had no access to it correct I told them that I think he had my cell phone all the time yes I did And you told them that the only time that you had access to it was when he would be standing over you and be and allow you to open your phone and, and do something on it, right? Yes, he was always next to me every time I could touch the cell phone. Okay. Well, we just saw the Publix video, right? Yes. Okay. And you stated on direct that. I could never leave his side. That was his mandatory order, right? Yes, I should always be next to him okay. on his side where he could see me. Okay, but we just saw the public's video. You're alone in that video, right? Yes. Okay, and you had your phone, and we know that now, right? Yeah. And there's a period of time that I think was left out about... Walgreens later in the day. I'm jumping around a bit. But later in the day, shortly before Eric leaves the house at 5 p.m., right? There's right. a period of time where you actually take Eric's car, correct? Correct. 
you're alone. Yeah, correct. Okay. You have your phone. Yes. And you know this because Detective Haynes and Detective Butt confronted you with this, correct? I don't believe I even told them. You told them that you had your phone? No, I told what I did. I don't know if I mentioned about the phone or not, but I told that I had his car and I went to Walgreens. You didn't tell them that on October 5th, though, correct? I don't know. Okay. You don't recall? I don't recall. Okay. It might have been one of the later days that you spoke to them. Yes, probably. They interviewed me a lot of times on that day. And so you went to Walgreens to pick up some prescriptions, and like we said, you were driving Eric's car. Yes, I was. Okay. Let's talk about your prescriptions for a minute. Mm -hmm. You're saying today that a lot of the information you gave the police that was either wrong or jumbled was because Eric had you take Xanax, right? Yes. And that Eric made you drink, right? Yes. Now, you are prescribed, at least back in when I took your deposition just a few months ago, I don't remember if you said you were prescribed it at that time or back in October of 2017, but you were prescribed two milligram Xanax bars, right? Correct. Okay. And it's a bar because the shape of the pill is like That's a long, right. a long shape. A long shape. And you were prescribed a two milligram bar in the morning and a two milligram bar at night or a four milligram bar in the morning and a, or two bars in the morning and two at night? I was prescribed two milligrams, and if it's necessary, I could take another two milligrams just to sleep, never in the day. Okay. But you also had extended release Xanax that was in your system all the time? I don't take all the time, just when I really feel in panic or afraid. So not all the time, all day, not every day I take it. Well, I meant the extended release when I said extended release means you take it and it stays in your system a while versus how you just described, you take it when you're in a panic about. When I take the, the extended release, it works during the day. I just feel calm, normal, not fear. And when I take to sleep, it helps me to sleep and not have nightmares okay. and sleep through the night. <clears throat> so typically in one sitting or one dose, you're only taking two milligrams, one bar. Exactly. Right, but you're saying that Eric made you take four. Exactly. So eight milligrams. Exactly. Okay, so that's what, four times the dose that you're prescribed. Mm -hmm. And yes, I'm sorry. And you never, on October 5th, right? So on October 5th, there were three different times that they brought you in and out of that interview room. Do you remember that? It was a very traumatic day, but I remember going in and out multiple times. And you never told them that Eric had made you take Xanax. I believe I did. You believe you told them on October 5th that Eric yes. made you take Xanax? Okay. And you never told the police on that day that you were unclear about the events of the day, right? I told them I was very in trauma and fear, and fear for my life, especially because I knew Eric was in the same place I was, so I was not sure about the events. Okay. But you didn't tell them, I'm, I'm under the influence right now, you need to, you know, take your time or speak slower, I can't comprehend you, nothing like that. No, nothing right? like that. Okay. And...
we just established you, you were also drinking alcohol, right? Correct. But you specifically didn't tell them about the alcohol, right? You specifically left that out. It wasn't that you forgot, but you specifically told them, didn't tell them about the alcohol because you were afraid they wouldn't trust you, right? No. No? Have you ever made a statement different than that? A different statement saying that I didn't take alcohol? That you, no, let me, let me clarify in case it got a little confusing. Mm-hmm. You told the police that you s- deliberately left out the fact that you were drinking alcohol to them because you were afraid they wouldn't trust you. No. Okay. to the police department, you swore to tell the truth, right? Yes. Oh, I thought I told you, I'm sorry, 147. Um. And permission to approach your room? You approach. Thank you. Start at line 12 mm-hmm. and go down to 25. And if you want to go to the next page, 148, okay. feel free. Read it to yourself, please. So you were having a discussion with the detectives, correct? Yes. And they confronted you with the fact that you actually were drinking, right? Yes. And your response to them was, well, I didn't tell you because I was afraid you didn't believe me because I was maybe drinking. I was afraid you were going to say, oh, because you were drinking, we can't trust you. I read that, but I don't remember saying it. But again, you're sworn in, just like you are today, right? Yes, of course. Okay. <clears throat> Let's talk about the point where Nicholas's, Nick's body was being taken out of the house, right? Okay. You testified on direct that you helped take the body out, right? I, Eric asked me to help him through the grass. I think that a little part of the grass that he couldn't was too high for him, I believe. Okay, so you helped him take the body out? Yes. Right? Have you ever made a statement different than that? I don't remember. Okay. I am looking at second deposition, page 18. You came in on March 29th, 2023 to do the second part of your deposition, correct? Yes. Again, there was a court reporter there, swore you in, you promised to tell the truth, all of that, right? Right? Right. Okay. Mm-hmm. Oh wait, I'm sorry, back up a second. Mm-hmm. It's it's not that deposition. October eleventh, the same statement we were just talking about, the one we just I just approached. 
stretch left. Page 57. Statement on October Let's look at page 29 from the October 5th statement. Can I skip the whole swearing in and all of that? Or you it's the same read? statement. It's then, the same. Then she's already swearing. asked an answer. All right. so. Thank you. ask you to read to yourself it's going to take take a little bit because it's long but start on line nine on page 29 okay and maybe go through the bottom of page 30. okay okay mm -hmm. thanks
say that you helped with the body, or do you characterize it as her being the one? Well, I said that he was taking the body out. He, right? Yes. A few times you said he. He. He, not we. <clears throat> he, right? Yes, because it wasn't we. He asked me a little help for a little specific of time. Okay. And I know it might look weird to a lot of people I'm that were not... <clears throat> All right, Ms. Tegarini, uh, just answer the, the, the question, okay. okay? All right, so again, sorry I'm bouncing around a bit, but no let's talk about um, when the police came to your house on October 5th, 2017 for the first time, right? Yeah. So you had called your ex-husband, right? Correct. And... The police then, I think, called you after you hung up with him, right? The first thing was that they called you? Yes. And then they came to your house? The police came. Right? Correct. And, of course, they ask you, you know, what's going on, what happened, tell me a little bit, right? Yes. And... Today, you are testifying that... The first place that you and Eric went was where? With the car. In the day? Mm -hmm. I said was to the courthouse. Okay. And <coughs> have you ever made a statement different than that? I don't remember. Now, you remember talking to the police when they came, right? Yes. And they asked you a few things about the timeline, correct? Correct. Okay, so I'm going to leave it at that for now. Now, today you testified that you took the F-150, right, that you and Eric drove in the F-150 to the courthouse Publix, right? Yes, I said that because that how is in my memory. Okay. And it's in your memory to the point where your recollection is that before Publix, you guys went to the Everglades. I, it's in my recollection because it was a lot of trauma and the timeline is confused. So, when you were just on direct and we were talking about the Publix by the courthouse, right? Yes. You said that Mr. Sapak showed you the time on the, the clock of the surveillance of you shopping and then said it was six minutes that we then see Eric, right? Yes. Right? And you said, yes, it was very quick, right? Yes. Are you saying that the whole entire thing from you guys getting to Publix to leaving was six minutes? It was very quick that he came back. Okay, so you guys are in the um, the Cadillac, right, at this point? Yes, as I was told in some <coughs> the video. And we know that because you were confronted with the surveillance video and the detective showed you the Cadillac, right? Yes. And you... Eric had to go to the courthouse, right? This building, right? Yes. Okay. So you dropped him off at the courthouse? I don't remember. Okay. And you then either hop into the driver's seat or you were driving all along over to the public's garage. As I said, I don't remember that part of the day correctly. Okay. Well... I mean, you just authenticated a video for the state saying, yeah, these are the timestamps, yeah, this, that, and the other, but... I'm talking about jumping from one side of the car to the other. I was even confused of which car it was. Okay, so that specific thing is... That is specific. All right, so then you, from what you've seen in the video, which they haven't, the jury hasn't seen yet, but you park in Publix, Right, presumably. Yes. And you then 
go into Publix from the garage. Yes. Right, and you're walking around. Yes, okay. I'm waiting for him. So, and Eric, you're not sure if he went in, into the courthouse or not? Not sure. But you remember that that is what he told you he had to do. Yes. Right? So, it seems pretty implausible that, and correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. just we've all been in this courthouse, that from dropping him off to you getting inside Publix that it was only six minutes, right? Well, the six minutes were inside Publix. Okay. Right, that's what I wanted to clarify. Mm -hmm. So if we're just talking whatever frame the state pulled up where we see you and then Eric, that's six minutes. That's what is in the video, yes. Okay. you about your communications on Facebook Messenger with Mr. Robinson, right? Right. And he said, you asked him to marry you, didn't you? Right? Yes, I did. Okay. Do you remember, have you had an opportunity to look at these um, Facebook communications before, other than that day? No. Would you like to just look them over before I... Start asking you questions? No? No, you can ask me. Okay. So, let's get to the marriage part. And if you need to refresh your recollection with them, just let me know. Okay, thank you. Sure. Do you recall taking a shower that morning? Yes, I do. Okay. What is your recollection as to when you took the shower? I took a shower when, right after Eric left to go to Chris' house to exchange the car. Okay. Now, he didn't tell you take a shower, correct? No, he, I don't remember if he said to take a shower. Okay, in fact, you actually said, I will take a quick shower and I'll wait for you, right? If it's you there, at, you yes. you want to look at it? No, you don't have to. Okay. And his response to that, do you recall what that was? No. Okay, so you had mentioned on direct about dressing sexy that Judge, I'm going to object this to your statement. Mm -hmm. It's a defendant's statement. As to what he said? Well... Defendant's statement, it's not your statement. It's kind of sidebar. <clears throat>
that issue, I'm sustaining the objection. Next question. Yes. <coughs> At some point, do you recall that you asked Eric to come home <coughs> that morning? Yes. Okay, and let's talk about there's a period of time in the morning, you said on, on direct, where Eric leaves the house. Yes. Right? Um, you did not tell the police about Eric leaving the house at any point that morning when you spoke to them later in the day. Isn't that true? Well, I don't remember not okay. telling them. Okay. Well, Eric leaving the house around 5 a.m., and leaving you alone would be a pretty big detail that police would want to know. Would you agree? I agree. Okay. And on direct, I believe you testified that you think Eric was only gone for a half hour to an hour, right? Yes, correct. Okay. And at some point, you told Eric, not only we have the marriage proposal, but you said, I'm your wife, right? You used that, that phrase, I'm your wife. Yes. Right? You told him that I need a drink, right? You wanted alcohol. I don't remember. Okay. May I approach to refresh your recollection? Yes, you can Thank refresh you. your recollection. We'll fill up on that. say you're going to shower, and after Eric tells you, okay, put on something sexy, you tell him, I need a drink too, right? Yes. I was so scared. <clears throat> and These messages are continuing throughout the day, right? This is how you two are communicating when you're in public, right? That's how we communicate it. Okay.
talk about the timeline. <coughs> At what point do you and Eric go to Nick's old place in work to try to get rid of the body? I remember we went there, it was too dark. So early, early in the morning. So that's, that wasn't talked about on direct, right? There was actually an additional place that you guys went. Yes. Um, and your recollection, it was very early on in the day. Because it was dark okay. and it was rainy. And you never told the police about that particular um, um, stop when you spoke to them the three times on October 5th. We just drove right there. He never stopped, nothing. He just came back and he didn't say a word. There was not part of anything of well, that day. But the intention was to dispose of the body there, right? That was why you guys went there. He wanted to see the dumpster there. Okay. And in fact, you are the one that said, this probably isn't a good spot. I think, I think he'll be found. No. No? And synergy, where, where Nick had worked, was C-I-N-E-R-G-Y, right? Or do you not know? I, yes, I believe so. Okay. The spelling, I just don't remember, but the name, yes. Okay. And that's actually in Sunrise, right? I'm not good on directions. I was always next in the passengers, but it's not that far. By the Sawgrass Mills Mall? Kind Probably, of? yes. Okay. Did you ever go there since you worked with him? Yes. Mm -hmm. And there were no people around at that point, right, at Synergy? No, it was very early. And when you get to Synergy, Um, okay, so today you're saying the first place you went was the Publix by the courthouse, right? Yes, okay. that I remember, yes. And, and you're saying, and, and have you ever made a statement different than that? 
that the first place was Publix. The Publix. I don't remember. Okay. And today you're saying after Publix, you and Eric went <coughs> to where? To Big Lots. To Big Lots, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And again, you're still in the Cadillac at this point. Right? I believe so. Okay. And have you ever made a statement different than that? I don't know. Okay. And after Big Lots is <clears throat> when you guys go home and switch cars, correct? I believe so. Mm -hmm. And your testimony is that the next place you go is the landfill, right? The dump. The dump. Right? Have you correct. ever made a statement different than that? Now that I recall. Okay. In fact, I think I already said this, but I'm not sure. But you never told the police about the landfill. Do you recall if you told them or not? I told them everything I could remember okay. that day. They discovered the landfill because of the receipt that was left in the car. No, I believe I no? told them. On October 5th, you think you told them about the landfill? Yes. Okay. And after the landfill, your testimony today was that you guys then drove out to the Everglades, correct? Correct. Okay. Have you ever made a statement different than that? No. And then after the Everglades is when you went to the Publix implantation to dump the body in the dumpster? Yes. Okay. And you're saying Eric was able to do that on his own? Yes. Okay. And after the Publix dumpster, you guys go home? Yes. And then we've established you went to Walgreens at some point? Correct. And then Eric leaves, I think that's the last thing, right? Eric leaves at around 5 p.m. Yes. Right? Okay. Now, when you were married to Nick Tagliarini, um, well, let me, let me ask you this. You and Nicholas Tagliarini were divorced, right? We are divorced. Okay. Mm -hmm. And when you were married to him, he was working on, he's an American citizen, right? Yes. And he was working on getting you um, papers. Let's go to sidebar. Go back for a minute before we talk about Nick Tagliarini. Um, remember when I asked you about the statement from October 11th about synergy? And I couldn't find the spot. Mr. Stadler found it. Page 68. Uh, or 69. 69. Well, why don't 
to refresh my memory as far as what you're trying to refresh from her. So we were talking about Synergy, right? The place where Nick Wilcox worked. Okay. And you said you did tell the police about it, right? Yes, I do so. Okay. And I said to you that the reason you guys didn't dump the body there is because you did not believe it would be a good spot, right? You said that I didn't. Okay, you're saying you never said that, right? Yes. Okay. I am approaching with your statement from October 11th to the detectives, page 69. Start reading on page, I'm sorry, on line 23. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's really mostly there, but you can read on to here too. On to page 70. Read to yourself, and when you're done reading, tell us if that refreshes your memory. Okay. want her to do it my way. Done reading. Is your memory refreshed? Yes, it is. Okay. So you just stated to me that you never said, or you were never the one that made a decision not to dump Mr. Wilcox's body at Synergy, right? Yes, I said it. Okay. But actually, to the police on October 11th, you told them that you were the one that said, I don't think we should dump it here, based on what you just read. I, had, I just read that, and there's a, there's a reason why. First, I never wanted him to dump up the person that I was in love and fiance in any, any dumpster at all. But it, and what he wanted me to tell the police that it, it was not him and Nick had <coughs> disappeared, they would, quickly find the body soon. I was not able to lie. Okay. I, okay. I was not going to be able to lie, even though I, I wanted Eric to believe that I would. Okay, so you were concerned that they would find the body in, in that dumpster too quickly to be able for you guys to, you know, pull off the disappearance? No, not concerned about that. Concerned about when he wanted me to lie, that I, how how could I lie, saying that it, it was so close to the house? He would, they would probably know. That was my opinion in the okay. moment. Okay, so let me end with what <coughs> the Publix. That's ten minutes from your house in the middle of the day. That that was a fine place. I didn't have to choose. That was his choice. I just had to make sure that he would believe that I would say what he wanted to. Okay. You have permission to approach with defense C for identification. Okay. I'm going to show you. <coughs>
uh, ask Thank the you. limited questions that I yep. just permitted. Okay, so Ms. Tagliarini, you, um, we've established you've texted with your ex-husband at points, right? Nicholas Tagliarini. Yes. Okay. Permission to approach? Yes. Now, do not say what's in these text messages, mm -hmm. but just look through these pages. You know, you've seen these before. Um, and just look through these texts and tell me if you recognize this chain of text messages between you and Mr. Tagliarini. Recall those messages and like the weeks leading up to October fifth. Yes, I do. Okay. And your phone number was on here, the nine five five nine five four number we talked about, right? Yes. Okay. Thank you. I have nothing further. Any uh, redirect? Yes, yeah, just for <coughs> Ms. Tangerini, are you denying that you went to date once with the defendant? No. Are you denying that you went to the dump with the defendant? No. Are you denying that at one point you actually helped him lift the body? No. Are you denying that uh, you met him at Publix? No. Are you denying that you didn't escape? No. Are you denying that you didn't call anybody? No. Are you denying... I'm actually leading, Your Honor. That I'm going to uh, overrule as to those questions. Now, the conversation that you had between uh, you and Eric, uh, he asked you if you used the condom with Nick. Could you repeat, please? He asked, the defendant asked you, when you had sex with the decedent, Nicholas Wilcox, did you use the condom? Did he ask you that? Yes. Okay. At one point, he even asked you that you were making objection. him nervous, correct? Objection, the same objection that the state had to Let's rephrase the question, uh, not so leading, please. Did Eric ever ask you or tell you that you were making him nervous while he was gone? Yes. And finally, <coughs> Miss... Uh, Ms. Newman talked about, she described it as a love contract, you called it a love letter, what have you, correct? It's a love letter. Love letter, okay. And you kept that love letter where? On the wall next to the bed. Okay. So I, the bed, my bed head was behind me, I slept on the right side and that was right there. And you attached it with a piece of tape? Piece of tape, Let yes. Let me ask you this, Ms. Tagorini. <coughs> that love letter that was written by Nicholas Wilcox? Yes. And it was written while the defendant was in custody, correct? Yes, correct. Okay, and did Eric tell you where it went afterwards? He said he took it. He saw it. <coughs> he saw it and he took it. Thank you. All right. Um, 
Before I release the witness, uh, if the attorneys can come sidebar, please. Ms. Uh, Tagorini, uh, you may step down. If you can just wait outside with um, for further instructions, uh, the, the, the attorneys will be with you in a moment. Okay. Okay. Um, in discussing with, uh, let me address the jury, uh, in discussing with the attorneys, um, this probably is a good place to, um, to recess for the day. Uh, as far as schedule, there are a number of things I have to meet with the attorneys about, including uh, what the most time consuming will be the jury instructions that you get at the end of the case. Uh, in light of the issues that I have to discuss with the attorneys, uh, we decided that tomorrow is just going to be a day for me and the attorneys and the defendant uh, where we can work out these issues and hopefully save time for you. So uh, the jury does not have to come in tomorrow. We're instead going to pick up the testimony Thursday morning at 930 and hopefully uh, the attorneys and I can resolve everything else that needs to be resolved. At least I'm, I try to be optimistic. Okay, so let me uh, remind the jury. Uh, you are to uh, discuss this case with no one, not even among yourselves. You're not to do any research on your own, go to any of the places discussed during the course of the testimony. And of course, uh, if you see anything in the media that you think could be related, please avoid it. Have uh, a good night, have a good Thursday. I'll see you. Um, uh, no, good Wednesday. I'll see you Thursday morning at 9.30. Leave your notebooks at or by your chairs. The deputy will take you out the back. Okay, we're outside the presence of the jury. Anything else we need to discuss before we adjourn today? Um, well, any reason why we can't start at 9.30? You know, yes, we all have to make uh, sacrifices. Okay, I'll, I'll see you at some... All right, you got 10 o'clock, fine. I would like, yeah, so we could have a charge conference, sure. All right, 10 o'clock it is. I'll see you tomorrow at 10 o'clock.